Hello everyone. Hola, hola a todas, a todos. I am Mildred Lopez and today I will be your host. I would like to welcome you to the 2021 Doctoral Student Forum of the, of the U21 Health Sciences Group Annual Meeting hosted by Tecnológico de Monterrey School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Of course, we would have loved to meet you all in person and have you visit the wonderful mountains of Monterey City, the delicious Mexican food, and make you dance to the traditional mariachi songs. But we are delighted to use this technology to, to be together in this format, besides the, the physical distance. To start today's session, I would like to welcome the wonderful Dr. Arturo Santos, Director of Technology-Based Entrepreneurship from the Interdisciplinary Research Group. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Santos. Thank you very much for the introduction. Good morning, good day, and good afternoon to all of you. On behalf of the Universidad 21 Health Sciences Group and the Tecnológico de Monterrey School of Medicine and Health Sciences, it is an honor for me to welcome you to the virtual International Doctoral Student Forum, framed in the 2021 annual meeting, which is focused on prevention, well being, and longevity in the post COVID world. For Tecnológico de Monterrey, research is a strategic activity since scientific knowledge is the engine that generates innovative solutions to our country's economic, social, and environmental development. As a leading research institution, we are committed to the idea that scientific and applied research, as well as technology transfer to impact society. To make that possible, our objective is to develop research focus on high impact topics through open, collaborative, and interdisciplinary innovation linked with national and international stakeholders. Knowledge generation, new talent development, international collaboration and multidisciplinary applications are all essential elements for knowledge economy connected to competitivity. We have prepared an exciting program that includes three master sessions. Professor Marco Rito will be presenting research strategies in health. Dr. Joaquin Zuniga will talk about emerging respiratory viruses and their long damage mechanisms. And finally, an exciting topic from the necessity to research and from research to clinical application in breast cancer in Mexico. This will be covered by Dr. Cynthia Villarreal. I especially would like to recognize the effort of all doctoral students that are here today. Through the call for abstracts, they presented world-class research and have made many thesis advisors very proud. Today, we will attend 54 of those doctoral student contributions from 12 different countries and 31 disciplines included in this program. We look forward that this doctoral student forum will provide an adequate framework opportunity, especially for future collaborative research. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the forum. Thank you, Dr. Santos, for the wonderful message. The next part of our program are the master sessions. We're going to have three different topics with amazing guests. To start off, I would like to welcome my colleague, Dr. Mirna Gonzalez. She is a research professor from the Bioengineering and Regenerative Medicine Group of the School of Medicine. Dr. Gonzalez, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. It's my pleasure to coordinate the opening master session of Dr. Marco Rito Palomares, entitled Research Strategies in Health from Tech de Monterrey. Before we start, I would like to introduce our speaker. Professor Marco Rito Palomares is full research professor of bioprocess engineering in Tecnológico de Monterrey, doctorate in chemical engineering from University of Birmingham. He has published more than 170 scientific publications, participated in 280 national and international conferences, and has been granted 16 patents. 
Dr. Rito Palomares is member of multiple organizations, including the Scientific Committee of the International Foundation for Science, the American Chemical Society, the International Society for Molecular Recognition, the Mexican Academy of Science, and the National Research Council Level 3. He has obtained multiple institutional, national, and international awards, such as the National Award in Science and Food Technology, Jubilee Award granted by the Swedish government and the vis visiting by a fellow from Cambridge University. In 2017, he became Dean of Research and Graduate Studies at the School of Medicine and Health Science of Tecnológico de Monterrey. And one year later, he became Dean of Research at Tech Salud of Tecnológico de Monterrey. Today, he will be sharing with us his expert opinion on the current research strategies that Tech de Monterrey is implementing to address the major health issues that affect our society. With that, I ask that you give your full attention to Dr. Rito Palomares. Please, Dr. Rito Palomares, the microphone is all yours. We have the presentation recorded, isn't it? Okay. Good morning and good afternoon. What I would like to do today is to share with you the strategy research uh, from Tech de Monterrey, particularly in the health sector. So first of all, I would like to mention that Tech de Monterrey is the first leading university in Mexico and the fourth in Latin America. This is ranked by the QS ranking that just were released recently. But what I would like to do today is just to talk a little bit about what we think is the best strategy that we can perform as a university. Uh, talking about health, Tech Salud, which is part of Tech de Monterey, is the healthcare system and is committed to deliver patient care, education, and research through our academic medical center. So the research related with healthcare is performed at Tech Salud within Tech de Monterey. Initially, we define four priority research area. It's cardiovascular diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, cancer, and metabolic diseases. But all the effort around these four areas are related to prevention, early detection, and treatment. We define this for particular areas because we want to be known in these areas. We are kind of growing in talent and infrastructures in, in these particular areas. But what is the research strategy at Tech de Monterey? So first of all, I would like to describe how we see research in the health sector at Tech de Monterey. We have to start with basic research, that is lab bench. And in this is basically the effort is in knowledge creation that will allow us to perhaps discover a particular new compound that uh, will be used for, for a particular treatment, but also a particular biomarker. And all this information can end up in new tools and treatment and the application to the, to the patient. So that's what we call from basic research to bedside. So this um, development at basic research area can have an impact in, in the clinical 
side. However, so most of the time, this development does not necessarily match from uh, what the patient or the society needs. So it is very important then to have uh, what we call clinical observation. So to identify why the patient needs in order to go back and try to understand this. A very uh, recent example is the COVID pandemic. So this was um, a problem at the society and then have to be uh, go back to the lab and try to understand what is going on in order to have diagnosis kids in this particular case to try to address some uh, prevention issues and definitely some treatment to vaccine. So this look from basic research to clinical research and vice versa is what we call translational research. At Tech de Monterey, what are we doing with this? And I will describe two major efforts in this particular um, strategy. The first one is related with basic research. And here we have defined what we call a strategic research group. And in the clinical research side, what we call the clinical research and preclinical, but with a strong orientation to uh, company creation, startup and spin up. So what is uh, a strategic research group? Well, it is not quite different from the rest of the research group in other university. It is our interdisciplinary teams dedicated to research in very priority health area. It's integrated by a leader, a PI, and, and a research distinguished professor, PhD student, master student, in, and of course, undergrad student. But two major aspects that I would like to raise, it's the clinical, the participation of the clinical professors and residents. This is in the health sector, perhaps one of the major difference, for example, with the engineering area in which the participation of clinical prof professors are those that are in contact with patients so they can identify the major problems that need to be addressed by the basic research. In this particular uh, aspect, we have defined eight strategic research projects, groups, and, and there are some numbers uh, put it there, but I would like to describe a little bit more what are the eight research group and are related again in the four major research area that we describe, cardiology, neurology, and oncology, but all the effort related, and of course, metabolic diseases to early detection, treatment, and prevention. You can observe or you can see that all of the groups are related to this particular research area from cancer, human genetics, but even applied science, metabolic diseases, and, and of course, uh, bioinformatics, which is very important for the early detection aspect. In the particular aspect of the clinical and preclinical research, we have established a strategy that is based initially with a strong portfolio with biopharma industry very well established protocol. And also there are original protocols from our university. And this gives us credit. This of course is a very uh, important aspect for us because this major big pharma uh, industry are performing protocols with us. But also we have defined what we call a strategic project. And I just would like to mention two of them the cure back protocol and what we call the origin. The cure back is perhaps one of the major protocol to test the COVID vaccine. In this particular uh, case, more than 2000 patients uh, for this treatment. And this is important because Tech de Monterey was selected by CureVac as one of the major sites in Latin America to test this uh, product. Origin is a Tech de Monterey initiative to uh, sequence 
the genome of almost 100,000 Mexicans. So this is also a very strategic and important project that will allow us to get information in order to perform additional projects, again, for prevention, treatment, and early detection of the major diseases that are in Mexico, particularly metabolic disease. But the strong effort of this clinical research is to company creation or to industry creation, to start up. So not just the knowledge creation and the application, but also the, the impact to society. It is very important to perhaps describe what, how we see innovation and entrepreneurship. We start with research, translational research. And in this particular um, part of the pyramid, we have focus in particular areas, attract the best talent to establish a very well-known and very um, state-of-the-art infrastructure definitely establish a strong networking. But now we are putting a lot of effort in innovation that all these end up in the benefit for the society. How? Well, by establishing startup and spin off and with this information and with this particular strategy. How we are addressing, and perhaps this is one of our major challenges that we have defined in order to create value from research. And we have defined, divide the strategy in three parts. First is to attract, then to enhance, and to participate. To attract the best candidate through internal and external event, so we will be able to select the best candidate that might end up and have a major impact to society. Of course, this candidate, it could be a, a treatment, again, a device, cannot be just left, left, left alone. So we need to work within the path from the knowledge creation to actually the creation of a startup. And definitely, we are very committed to participate, not just in the risk, but also in the benefits through a, um, perhaps a, a participation of share. This is a strategy that we are following and we are applying internal and externally. That means if a, a faculty from Tech de Monterey have a strong idea, then in, they can walk through this path. But also, if an external um, initiative arrives to us and perhaps they need a clinical a trial, then we can establish a collaboration and implement this path. For us, this is perhaps the major challenge that we have defined. And this is a way to see how research and knowledge creation can have an impact in society. How can we achieve this? Definitely with different potential collaboration scheme from research through our strategic research group in the area that we already defined, but definitely through our graduate and undergrad programs. So the students are definitely the major asset that we have. And we have been exploring a different strategy. One of them is that our student spend after one year with our partner lab. We are definitely committed to achieve this major goal and make a difference, not just as a normal uh, research university, but also as a university that create value to society. I would like to end this short talk by uh, thank you for the organizing and be open to any question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rito Palomares for your interesting talk. We now move forward for the question and answer session. The first question is, 
The link between clinician and basic research areas is crucial to develop efficient treatments for human disease. In your opinion, what will be a strategy to attract more clinicians into the research field? Well, thank you very much for, for the question. Uh, I think there are different strategies to address this issue. But the first one, and it's very, very simple, is to put them together. I think there are kind of a division between the two professionals. And one of the strategies that we have defined at Tech de Monterey is that this, is, this research group that I described it must be formed by clinical and non-clinical research. That way you put them together and start talking about the different experience and the most important, identify the potential problems to be addressed. Thank you. Next question. The number of companies dedicated to solve health issues is limited and not all survive to the market. So in your opinion, what is the biggest challenge during the process of creating a company that can guarantee its success? That's an excellent question. And we have to be aware that out of 10 initiative, perhaps one will be success. So you have to keep that in mind. And perhaps one of the way to, to easy the path is to try to select the best candidate and also be alert and aware that at certain point of the path, you might need to hand the, the development to some other um, players. Perhaps one, one of the major mistakes is that the inventor try to walk alone through the whole path. So he have to be aware to um, increase the team when he where the team that they started with and invite some, some other major player with uh, additional expertise. Thank you. And in this, as a follow-up, how can we establish more external collaborations between academia and industry, for example? Well, again, you need to know them. And one of the perhaps major mistakes from university or research group is that they try to generate solution for a problem that perhaps the industry does not need. So the first point is really try to know the industry, the external needs. I think that is perhaps the, the major recommendation. So as a researcher, you have to be aware and put perhaps first what society and industry needs and then start working from, from there. Thank you. And would you like to share a last comment for the doctoral students that are hearing your, your speech right now? Well, um, I mean, they, they are the, the first step. I mean, they are the, the most important element in this uh, path or chain of knowledge, from knowledge creation to impact to society. Actually, uh, these at this, the level of the doctoral is where the major problems are identified and novel solution emerge. So again, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to share part of the experience, not just from my group, but from my university. So thank you very much. And with this, we have reached the end of the first master session. Thank you again, Dr. Rita Palomares for your participation and as well the rest of the audience for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez and Dr. Rito for the interesting discussion. <clears throat> now, I would like to welcome my colleague, Dr. Patricia Segura Medina. She is a research professor from the National Institute of Respiratory Diseases and from our school at Tecnológico de Monterrey. Welcome, Dr. Segura. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to me to be part of this, this session. And it's a great pleasure to present Dr. Joaquin Zuniga. Uh, I want to present uh, 
uh, the curriculum of Dr. Zuniga. He received his PhD degree from the National University uh, of Mexico, and then he moved to Dr. Edmund Jones lab in, at Harvard Medical School in Boston, where he carried out his postdoctoral training. Dr. Zuniga then joined to the National Institute of Respiratory Disease in Mexico City, where he was conducted clinical research student studies in patients with pulmonary tuberculosis and influenza with virus infection. Dr. Zuniga participated in the initial description of the first cases of severe pneumonia caused by the pandemic influenza virus A H1N1, which emerged in Mexico in, in, tw in 2009. Since, since then, Dr. Zuniga research has focused on the study of protective immunity against pathogen as well as on the epigenetic control of immune response occurring at the lung. In the recent years, he explored the immunopathology of severe forms of COVID-19 and in collaboration with diverse institutions, his group have described novel diagnosis methods for SARS-CoV-2 and is participating in the development of peptide-based vaccines against this virus. Since 2017, Dr. Suniga is the head of the research of the National Institute of Respiratory Disease. And now he is a national investigator level three on the National Research uh, Researcher System of Mexico and is the director of the bioscience program at the Tecnológico de Monterrey in Mexico City. So for us, it's a great pleasure to present Dr. Zuniga and his presentation. And it's important to me to tell you, if you have any kind of questions about this presentation, please send your questions to the chat. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Zuniga, please. We want to hear your presentation. Please, can you put the presentation of Dr. Zuniga, please? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to thank to the organizers of this important meeting for inviting me to share with you some aspects of research we are doing at the Tecnológico de Monterrey and in collaboration with other institutions about the mechanisms of uh, COVID pathogenesis and lung damage. So in this slide, I'm showing you the, the institutions that are involved and many researchers that also are contributing to this effort, this international effort, in order to understand different mechanisms of COVID-19 pathogenesis. Uh, as you know, there are several coronaviruses, and some of them, such as alpha and beta coronaviruses, are of clinical relevance because they have the ability to uh, induce uh, human disease. So in the last 20 years, three coronaviruses have emerged, MERS-CoV, SARS-CoV, and in the last two years, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, these novel coronaviruses uh, predominantly, as you know, infect lower respiratory tract, and they um, have, an, have shown an important uh, case fatality rate in human populations, uh, SARS-CoV, uh, in 2002 and 2003, uh, uh, a case fatality rate of 10% were reported. MERS uh, was associated with a case fatality rate of 35%. And at this time, the SARS-CoV-2 has a range of a fatality rate between 0.8 to 8.0. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, infect human cells uh, by the attachment to the ACE2 receptor, 
at the surface of different kinds of cells. As this receptor is expressed in a white uh, group of cells, and that's why the virus has the ability to infect different tissues. And apparently, SARS-CoV-2 also has the capacity to infect cells by binding with more strongly um, ability than other previous coronaviruses. Genomic studies about the origin of SARS-CoV-2 have demonstrated that this virus is closely related to pangolin coronaviruses and bat coronaviruses. And as you can see here in this phylogenetic study, so the close proximity of these viruses is very well documented. Other hypotheses of the possible origin of the virus, such as escape of uh, BSL-4 laboratories at Wuhan have, have been uh, not confirmed until now. Uh, these studies demonstrated also that uh, the human SARS-CoV-2 has a uh, sequence of four amino acids that allowed to the S1 subunit of the S protein of the virus to be proteolytically uh, processed by human proteases. And this sequence is not present in other uh, coronaviruses that are closely related to uh, to this uh, human SARS-CoV-2. So this is important because this uh, sequence allows the virus to infect all the, uh, many cells in, in humans. And uh, this sequence, as I told you before, is not present in other very close uh, coronaviruses. And other characteristics of this coronavirus is the, the sequence of five amino acids in the a receptor binding domain that allowed to the virus to uh, attach very well to the ACE2 receptor. What's happening from the epidemiological point of view? So basically we have uh, at least more than 200 million of cases confirmed of this infection while work and uh, more than 4.4 million of uh, deaths associated to this infection. In Mexico, we have uh, uh, the official uh, uh, information suggests that we have more than 3 million of, case, of confirmed cases and around 256,000 of deaths associated to the SARS-CoV-2 infection. So from the clinical point of view, the clinical spectrum of the disease is, is very wide. So most of patients are uh, have the capacity to control the pathogen. Many of them can be asymptomatic or have a mild or moderate disease. However, there is a subgroup of patients, around 5%, that has the capacity to, uh, to generate a very uh, important uh, long and systemic inflammation, and they have a lack of control to, of the viral replication. These uh, uh, mechanisms of inflammation and viral replications induce frequently lung damage associated to acute respiratory distress syndrome and systemic uh, uh, inflammation. In a recent study, we published uh, the clinical risk factors associated to mortality in critically ill patients uh, that were hospitalized at the national Institute of Respiratory Diseases, and we detected that some of the most important factors that contribute to mortality is the fall of change in the ventilatory ratio, and also the fall of change in lymphocytes, and also renal involvement. So uh, the cumulative survival rates in these patients with severe COVID, we observed that patients that were hospitalized seven days they have a survival of 82%. Patients that were hospitalized 14 days have a survival of 56%. And then patients with 21 days of hospitalization has a 47, point, 47 survival rate. And patients with uh, hospitalized during 28 days had 42% uh, of survival. This is a very uh, good rate of survival in this critically ill patients. Uh, with this uh, fact in mind, so we, uh, as, and as you know, uh, many factors are, symbol, are involved in the, in the mortality of, uh, of COVID-19, and particularly the, the, in patients older than 60 years, uh, 
uh, the, the mortality increases uh, dramatically. So uh, with this in mind, we decided to explore the possible effect of the of uh, inflammatory mechanisms in the mortality in, in patients older than 60. So for in this study, we inf uh, infected primates, non-human primates uh, with the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and these primates were old and, and very young uh, primates. So then we obtain human, uh, uh, obtain long tissue from these primates, sorry. And then we analyze the expression of different genes in the lung of these animals. And then we observe that uh, the interferon signaling genes were highly expressed in early stages of the disease, particularly in young individuals. When we analyzed uh, uh, older individuals, we observed that they have a kind of uh, delay in the, in the mechanisms of interferon gamma expression. So this suggests that possible uh, in early stages of the disease, the interferon gamma and type one interference will be very important to control the viral replication and uh, avoid the long damage associated to uh, high uh, viral loads in these individuals. In contrast, in older individuals, we observed that the genes associated with neutrophil degranulation were highly expressed. That suggests that these uh, kind of cells contribute in, in the lung tissue damage. In humans, we also observed in blood that uh, those individuals older than 60 years have uh, very high levels of neutrophils and possibly this explain the severity of the disease in older individuals. We also analyzed the expression of different cytokines and chemokines and growth factors in patients with severe COVID. And then we compared these uh, uh, levels of uh, circulating cytokines, chemokines, and growth factors in patients with uh, moderate disease and also with other viral infections such as influenza. And as you can see, we observe an increase of uh, type, one, uh, type 1 and type 2 interference, and also some cytokines, very interesting, very interesting such as interleukin-1 and uh, interleukin-4 were significantly increased in these patients. So then we analyzed the, the effect of these uh, molecules in the uh, susceptibility to develop severe disease. And as you can see, IL-4, IL-7, IL-8, IL-12, and IL-15 were associated with severity of the disease and other clinical uh, aspects such as um, illness onset and also white blood cells levels, neutrophil levels, uh, the use of antibiotics and SOFA were also associated to severity of COVID-19 in human, in Mexicans. Um, we are working, uh, exploring other molecules such as uh, possible biomarkers of disease progression. And then we decided to explore this molecule in patients with uh, severe COVID. This uh, surfactant D protein is a very interesting protein because it's associated with immunomodulation in, in lung infections and circulating levels possibly indicates alveolar damage. In order to determine if the alveolar damage is a, a condition that can uh, predict the out outcome of the disease, we decided to explore the, the circulating levels of this surfactant D protein in different uh, pulmonary conditions including influenza, COVID-19, pulmonary tuberculosis, and COPD. And as you can observe, so we found very high levels of this molecule, particularly in patients with influenza, suggesting that the alveolar damage is predominantly in, in, in this condition, but not in COVID or, and other conditions, okay? So this biomarker differentiates or helps to us to differentiate severe disease by COVID and severe disease by influenza. And this possible will be very important in the next few years when we have a syndemic effect of both conditions when they appear together in the future. So uh, the, the survival, uh, the possibility of survival 
was uh, higher in patients with lower levels of uh, surfactant T when compared with patients with high levels of surfactant T protein. Uh, uh, these patients were uh, uh, infected by the influenza H1N1 virus. We are doing other studies. So we are uh, analyzing the production of profibrotic factors and other soluble factors that possibly are associated with the long damage the interstitial long damage that apparently is more uh, important in COVID-19. And we also are studying some T lymphocytes, the subpopulations of some T lymphocytes that possibly are associated with the regulation of the inflammation. Other subpopulations of cells that we are studying are NK, natural killer cells, and also B lymphocytes that are able to produce neutralizing antibodies. In the recent uh, uh, months, we started a protocol uh, focus on the understanding of uh, neutralizing antibodies production in those patients that were previously vaccinated by different uh, vaccines, and then uh, they develop after some uh, months uh, a severe disease by COVID-19, by the new strains of COVID-19, such as Delta, that apparently has a more capacity to be transmitted with, among humans. So uh, I, I can conclude that the immunopathology of these respiratory infections uh, are uh, reflecting a complex interaction between the pathogen and the specific characteristics of these pathogens and the host human responses. These uh, host responses are uh, uh, influencing definitely the, uh, the lung uh, injury and the strength of lung injury. And it's necessary to explore in the new uh, in the new patients with novel viruses, the possibility to moderate the immunopathology to reduce mortality uh, in these uh, infections by emerging viruses. So I thank you very much for your attention and I hope uh, uh, this lecture uh, is useful for you and I'll be pending uh, and I'll be here waiting for some questions and thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Dr. Zuniga, for your excellent lecture. I'm pretty sure that it will be very useful for all the audience. And it's important to talk in about the application of preci precision medicine for COVID-19. Uh, in this case, maybe because we need to take it in account phenotypes, endotypes, and subtypes uh, of uh, passions in order to understand the, these symptoms, biology and prognosis of uh, the patients. And it's important to take it in account for, for, the, for give the basis of the precision care in this case. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your lecture. And it's a great pleasure to, to have you in our, in our panel. Thank you very much, Dr. Segura and Dr. Zuniga. It was a very interesting discussion. Now I would like to, to welcome my colleague, Dr. Hector Marcelino. He's a medical specialist in oncology and a doctoral student in the PhD in clinical sciences at Tecnológico de Monterrey. Welcome, Dr. Marcelino. Hello, everyone. Hi. Well, um, it is a pleasure for me to introduce you, um, Dr. Cynthia Villarreal, who is my mentor. So Dr. Cynthia Villarreal is a board certified medical oncologist, master's in science and doctorate in clinical research. She completed a breast cancer fellowship at the Sunnybrook Odette Cancer Center affiliated to the University of Toronto. Since 2007, Dr. Cynthia Villarreal is professor at the Instituto Tecnológico y de Estudios Superiores de Monterrey. She has obtained multiple institutional, national, and international awards, including Premio Miguel Alemán Valdez, Premio Mujer Tech, Premio Bienal de Fun Salud a la Investigación en Cáncer de Mama, 
ESCO International Development and Education Award and the Avon, Avon Foundation Global Breast Cancer Clinical Scholars Program. She has published more than 100 peer-reviewed manuscripts and integrates the National Researchers Council Level, level 2. Her projects are dedicated to improving the living conditions of breast cancer patients in Mexico. She is currently the medical director of the Breast Cancer Center of the two affiliated hospitals of the Tecnológico de Monterrey. She created and leads Joven y Fuerte, the Mexican Young Breast Cancer Program. She is also the founder of Milk, an NGO dedicated to the improvement of cancer and supportive care among breast cancer patients in Mexico. Please welcome Dr. Cynthia Villarreal. Hi, hello to everybody. It is my great pleasure to present today in the U21 Health Sciences Group Annual Meeting 2021. My uh, talk, it's named From Necessity to Research and from research to clinical application in the breast cancer field in Mexico. And uh, my objectives are to present two examples of how our group has um, created two initiatives and this have translated into uh, research. So first, as a framework, uh, it is important to know that breast cancer is the most common cancer worldwide with more than 2.2 million incident cases in 2020. And that is also the main cause of cancer and the leading cause of cancer death in women in our country. One of the biggest needs in Mexico is that breast cancer is frequently diagnosed in advanced stages. And this is one figure that represents this. So more than 50% of all breast cancer cases are either diagnosed as locally advanced breast cancer or stage four breast cancer. And this obviously translates into a worse prognosis. So there has been uh, research done on, on trying to know why uh, patients present in, this, in these advanced stages. So one of the uh, biggest problems is the delay of diagnosis. So here in Mexico, a very important researcher, Dr. Carla Unger Saldaña, which is a former student of Tecnológico de Monterrey, has been doing um, a research on this topic. And she um, did a study, a very important study of 886 patients uh, treated uh, in four public hospitals in Mexico City with breast cancer. And what Dr. Unger Saldaña found out is that the total interval, uh, which means when the patient um, uh, has a problem uh, until she receives treatment uh, is seven months, which is a very, very long time. And this is mainly due because of health system intervals. There is a very, very big delay in the public health systems in Mexico. So when we found or when we have uh, studied these um, reasons, the diagnostic delay, we intended to um, activate a program which is called Alerta Rosa in Nuevo León. What is Alerta Rosa? It is an effective referral system for all women with breast symptoms or abnormal studies in Nuevo León that seeks to reduce the delay in the diagnosis of breast cancer in our community. And the directors of this program are Dr. Teresa Mireles and Dr. Jaime Tamez, and I work together with them uh, to develop and uh, organize this program. So how, how the program works is that when a patient detects a palpable mass or a breast problem, she calls us or she, um, by, by Facebook or other means, uh, she contacts the program and a patient navigator uh, takes her with her hand and navigates the program through the different um, um, medical attention that she needs, either consultations or uh, breast studies or a biopsy if the patient has a, a breast uh, 
suspicion. And if the patient ha has a cancer, so if we diagnose this cancer, then we do a direct referral to the affiliation where the patient belongs. So our aim is to do all these process in less than 30 days. So we have um, already published the results of Alerta Rosa, and this has um, th these are the results. So from January 2017 to December 2019, 1,217 alerts have happened in our program. From these, we diagnosed 43 breast cancer patients, and the interval system, um, or the, the health system interval, was 39 days, and we only took 16 days to have a diagnosis. So these 39 days are very, very different of the, uh, compared to the seven months that was already uh, reported in the health public system in Mexico. So with these uh, results, we take, took it to the next level and we published already two important papers where we describe our program, our results, how we have achieved this, and we have two publications, one in 2018 and another one in 2020, where we describe a prioritization in within the Alerta Rosa program to um, even reduce more the delays in patients that have a, a strong suspicion of breast cancer. Uh, uh, also, our results have been uh, disseminated through a newspaper and uh, TV. And um, we're very proud that in the 2020 report of the World Health Organization, they exemplify our program, our Alerta Rosa program, as an, an initiative in Mexico uh, that has uh, already uh, proved to reduce uh, delays in, in breast cancer diagnosis. So these are all our collaborators, collaborators that have, have helped us to develop this program and that are still part of this initiative. So the second need is that breast cancer in Mexico is diagnosed at younger ages. Uh, so we started on noticing this and we did a first publication where we reported how many young patients are diagnosed in Mexico. So from all the patients that we see, 11% of all patients have uh, 40 years or less, which is very, very prevalent. We have a very prevalent young group of breast cancer patients, which translates in around 2,300 yearly cases in Mexico. So we started searching more and we did some uh, more findings. So we did a very uh, important um, project where we described uh, a cohort at Incan in Mexico City, where we found that from 4,300 4, patients, 15% 15, 15 of them were very young. Um, and this uh, has been repeated in other referral centers. In these young women, more than 50% of them uh, present with very large tumors, 75% with nodal disease. And this translates in that uh, patients, the young patients have a, a worse disease-free survival and worse overall survival compared to their older counterparts. Another very important area of research that our group has done is to know what are the medical and information needs among young patients with breast cancer in Mexico. So we developed a study where we um, had five focal groups that included 29 patients uh, that had a diagnosis in the last six to 12 months. And we found that young patients in our country have three priority unmet needs. One, that they require psychological care. They need emotional support before and after their consultation, and not only them, but for their family members. They also require more assertive communication by their healthcare providers. Um, and also they require more written and electronic information regarding specific topics of breast cancer and their side effects. So they uh, asked for educational material to take home. So with all these, 
we started um, a, a program, a special program for young women called Joven y Fuerte, Programa para la Atención e Investigación de Mujeres Jóvenes contra el, con, el, con Cáncer de Mama, that is active in three uh, institutions, one in Mexico City, Instituto Nacional de Cancerología, and the two hospitals in Tech Salud. And we try to uh, met the young women's needs regarding not only medical needs, but also emotional and psychosocial needs. So the objectives of Joven y Fuerte is to optimize the clinical care and support needs for their women and their families, to educate, educate patients, general public health professionals about their requirements, to promote medical, biomedical, and psychosocial uh, research focused on their particular medical and psychosocial needs, and to replicate this model. So this is the first Latin American initiative of this type who has been developed and has reported results. So how does the Joven y Fuerte program works? So when a patient uh, is confirmed to have breast cancer diagnosis and she's young, uh, a navigator approaches her and has an informative session. She invites the patient to their program and she detects the patient's needs. According to their needs, we make timely referrals we deliver, we deliver educational material and we invite our patients to forums and workshops. Up till now, we have included 684 patients in our program. And the main needs that we have met, it's about fertility preservation. So for now, 53 patients, patients have been referred for, ferti for fertility preservation. 520 have received appropriate and timely genetic counseling and 435 patients have received some kind of psychological support. And not only patients, but also their families, their husbands, their children. They have, made a, they have made a community now where they also support one another in this trajectory. Another one of the objectives of the program has been to uh, develop educational materials as our patients told us that they needed that. So we... Um, had a first manual that it's uh, freely available in our website where we have information, photographs, testimonials. Um, and then just uh, last year, we developed a second uh, manual called Informada Soy Mas Fuerte uh, that has been having a very, very nice, um, uh, patients think that it's very nice and it helps her, them a lot. Uh, we have this website that is totally available and freely available for patients with Spanish material, uh, with um, infographics, and a lot of uh, material that the patient can't um, review. We also have videos, and we have taken another step, and we are now uh, running a randomized multicenter study to evaluate the impact of a customable support material on the knowledge and satisfaction of patients with breast cancer. So right now, this uh, study is running in 11 uh, sites, uh, seven in Mexico and four in other four Latin American countries. And we will know if this specific material helps patients to make better decisions. Uh, another of the objectives of uh, Joven y Fuerte has been to disseminate this program among the public. We have been in the in TV, in the newspaper. And because of all this in 2015, in the Mexican consensus regarding diagnosis and treatment of breast cancer for the first time, uh, we had a, a chapter uh, focused on breast cancer patient that was developed by our group. So after having all this, the other uh, very important topic that we wanted to cover was research in this young patients. So we have developed a research platform where we collect prospective data on different lines of research regarding clinical pathologic characteristics, sociodemographic data, treatment patterns and outcomes, and other, and, and other sub-studies of cognitive, sexual quality of life and depression and anxiety changes. And we gather uh, biological samples which are frozen and stored for later use in research. Uh, by now we have 607 patients that have been, been included in the research protocols. The patient fill out electronic forms in tablets 
And uh, for now, we have at least published four different papers where we have uh, reported our results of the Joven y Fuerte program. One example is the fertility aspects of our patients. So 30% of our patients are single, 21% have not had any children, and 31% will, will um, wish to have more children. So there's a high prevalence of unsatisfied parity, and our program has um, a health patients to help, help 53 patients to preserve fertility. A very important aspect that we are also working on, it's about learning about their sexual function and satisfaction. And we have reported that patients have a very, very high prevalence of dysfunction and insatisfaction that even increases at six months. And at two years, it's lower, but it still is very, very high. So we need to uh, work on this and intervene more timely. Um, Right now, we are now working in uh, translational research projects, and this is one example of it. This is a thesis of Dr. Hector Diaz, and he is um, studying chemolecular abnormalities in young women with hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer. We just published this paper of the young, uh, the Joven y Fuerte experience in collecting real, real world data, and we um, develop. Uh, uh, there are different uh, points where we um, share how we have been doing this and how we have um, uh, for now having all these results. Joven y Fuerte is, ha has been recognized by the Global Cancer Institute as a unique initiative in Latin America that is trying to meet the needs of young patients. So these are the different collaborating associations that have been working with us, and these are uh, uh, institutions in uh, United States and Canada that have been our collaborators. So to finish up, um, there are different key aspects that we have to try to do to um, for the application of research in clinical practice. So first, we uh, need to identify local and tangible needs. We have to search for creative and feasible solutions, organize all the uh, collection of data and design in advanced research projects with specific aims. We have to do collaborative work. We have to get mentors that already know uh, about uh, what we want to uh, work with. Uh, we have to establish international and national collaborations. And in the internal team, we have to uh, work with students, interns, fellows, and obviously all the clinical team. We need hard work and pers perseverance, and obviously uh, love for our profession, team, and patients. And with this, I finished my talk, and uh, it was a pleasure to share with you uh, these uh, data. And uh, we uh, will now go to the Q&A session. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Dr. Villarreal, for this wonderful um, presentation. I think we as doctoral students have learned how to approach a problem through different methodologies. So. Uh, I think it has uh, been a great experience for everyone, as it was for me, to uh, listen to this wonderful lecture. Um, for now, for uh, these Q&A sessions, uh, we have this one. Dr. Villarreal, what can be done in terms of health education to avoid those huge delays in the management of breast cancer patients, both for the public and for and for the undergraduate medical students. Thank you, Hector, uh, for for the question, and I think it's very important, and it's one of the main areas that our group has been working in, like to try to get more more um, notion of this problem, not only in, in the, the medical field, but also in the general population. We have been doing research on that. I, I didn't mention this on my, on my talk, but uh, 
Dr. Unger, who is one of the main leaders um, starting this area of why, what, are, what are the reasons of the delays in the breast cancer diagnosis. We have uh, worked in, in studying what are the, the causes in young women. And we have noted and reported also that young women um, actually gets more delays uh, in, in the diagnosis and that translates into uh, more locally advanced breast cancers. So as I mentioned, there are bigger uh, tumors, more uh, involvement of the axilla and more metastatic disease in these patients. And one of the main reasons that this happens is because there are errors in the diagnosis and it's re, um, in relation to the, to the patient. So many times the patient takes very long to get um, uh, um, medical attention and medical care because they think that they don't, because they're young, they won't have uh, a malignant diagnosis. But also when they get to the uh, physicians, to the primary care physicians, there are many, many errors. So the physicians don't um, take into account that breast cancer diagnosis also can, can happen in, in young women. So I think uh, this is very important. We have to, to um, disseminate more this information on the general public, on the young women, but also we have to educate more on our primary care physicians that this is a prevalent problem and if that they have any suspicion that they have to refer these patients to, to the uh, appropriate medical experts. So um, uh, I think we should still have to, to work a lot on this. Thank you, Dr. Villarreal. I think we do not have any further questions. So good morning to everyone. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to, to both Dr. Villarreal and, and Dr. Hector Diaz. These uh, master sessions have been amazing. I have learned so much from our colleagues and, and guests, but I have to say I was eager to get to this part of the session, the doctoral students' presentations. These past months, I have read about the amazing research projects that all of you are, are working in and I want to take a minute to, to recognize this, has, this very hard work. Uh, I would also like to, to invite you to go into the platform and visit the posters. You can interact with them and, and send out questions or comments to the authors. Uh, I think a strength of this forum is that the interaction, this interaction where, where we share and we build together. Um, to start with this part of the program, I would like to, to welcome Dr. Raquel Cuevas. She's a research professor of the Bioengineering and Regenerative Medicine Group of Tecnológico de Monterrey School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Welcome, Dr. Cuevas. Thank you, Dr. Mildred Lopez. So we will not now proceed with our first talk. After, after the, the presentation will have a small session of questions and answers. So let's um, go ahead and start with the first one. Greetings, everyone. My name is Tukisi Kariso Prince. I'm a PhD candidate, advanced midwifery and neonatal nursing sciences from the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. My research study is entitled The Development of the Scope of Practice for Advanced Midwife and a Neonatal Nursing Science Specialist in South Africa. One may ask, what is the difference between a midwife and an advanced midwife and a neonatal nursing specialist? A midwife is a person who has successfully completed a midwifery education and training program, which is based on the International Confederations of Midwives Essential Competencies, which are the pillars and the prescriptions of the midwifery practice and the framework for global standards of midwifery education. 
And that person is recognized as a midwife by the regulatory body in their country of origin. So in the South African context, the South African Nursing Council is going to be the regulatory body for the midwife. And an advanced midwife and a neonatal nurse specialist is a registered nurse and a midwife who has an advanced expertise in the midwifery field because they hold an additional qualification in post-basic midwifery and in neonatal nursing science specialization. And they are registered as such by the South African Nursing Council that is in our country, South Africa. The differences between the two fields or the two categories, the midwife and an advanced midwife and neonatal nursing science specialist is dependent on the regulations which governs both the training as well as the scope of practice. A midwife in South Africa at an undergraduate or at a basic midwifery level, they are going to be trained under the regulation R425, regulation R254, regulation R174, and regulation R1497. And upon completion of their studies, they are going to practice under the prescripts of the scope of practice of a registered nurse, which is the regulation R2598, as well as the conditions under which a midwife carries their profession, regulation R2488. For an advanced midwife and a neonatal nurse specialist in South Africa, the training is prescribed by the regulation R212 and recently the regulation R683. But when it comes to the scope of practice of such a specialized practitioner, there is no specific scope of practice as yet. Therefore, our advanced midwives and neonatal nursing specialists in South Africa, they continue to practice under the prescripts meant for basic midwifery, which is the regulation R2598, as well as the regulation R2488. This has motivated the conduction of this study, the development of the scope of practice for the advanced midwife and a neonatal nurse specialist, which is going to be conducted under three phases. In phase one, I'm going to conduct a systematic review of the literature on the scope of practice of an advanced midwife and a neonatal nurse specialist globally, which is in our country, South Africa, and internationally. And in phase two, I'm going to rope in the midwifery experts as well as the advanced midwifery experts to assemble them to assist me in development of the scope of practice specific for the advanced midwife and a neonatal nursing science specialist. And in phase three, the newly developed scope of practice for an advanced midwife and a neonatal nursing science specialist is going to be evaluated and validated by an even wider panel of experts, which is going to comprise of academics in advanced midwifery and neonatal nursing science, doctors who are in obstetrics, the regulatory bodies in South Africa to evaluate this scope of practice. And this study is conducted under the supervision of our three supervisors here, Dr. Zalga Jansef van Rensbeck, Dr. Vanda Jacobs, and Dr. Alida Duplessy Fari. Special thanks to the University of Johannesburg Nursing Science Department for the special support throughout this study, as well as the financial support from the University of Johannesburg Supervisor Linked Bazari. And I thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kagiso Prince. Thank you very much for the presentation. So uh, I welcome the people in the public to make their questions through the chat. You can write your question or you can also raise your hand and, and you're welcome to ask the question yourself. Okay, so um, there are no, no questions. You're also welcome to go in the poster session and ask the question directly contacting the author. 
Okay, so we're gonna proceed to the second presentation. Informing effective behavior change interventions to household air pollution in urban Rwanda. Over half the world's population cook on biomass, resulting in exposure to high levels of household air pollution. People in resource poor countries have limited choice and access to clean fuels. I want to explore the role of short term harm reduction interventions to reduce exposure to household air pollution before cleaner fuels become available. Unanticipated consequences for potential interventions are important to understand. So I looked at malaria and household air pollution. Why research malaria and household air pollution? Women have previously reported that smoke produced from biomass deters mosquitoes and therefore reduces the risk of malaria infection. Malaria is seen as a greater risk than the health effects from household air pollution exposure, which reduces the likelihood of moving to practices which produce less smoke. Therefore, this chapter of my thesis aims to explore the potential risk of malaria infection in children under five between cleaner fuel transitions, biomass fuel type, cooking location, using the Demographic and Health Survey, DHS. Data was obtained for sub-Saharan African countries and selecting children under five years only. Missing data was handled with multiple imputation using the MICE package in R, imputing variables which had up to 50% missing. Two outcome measures of malaria included rapid diagnostic task and microscopy. Three HAP exposures were investigated, clean cooking, type of solid biomass fuel and cooking location. Multivariable logistic regression was used using the survey package in R, which took into account the complex sampling strategy. Results. Clean children residing in biomass cooking households had increased odds ratio of malaria infection by 57% compared to those residing in cleaner cooking households. Same effect was seen when comparing wood and charcoal cooking, with children residing in wood cooking households having increased odds of malaria by 77% compared to charcoal cooking. No association was observed when comparing indoor and outdoor cooking. However, when comparing the two types of indoor cooking, those children that resided in households that cooked in separate buildings had a decreased odd ratio of malaria by 26% compared to inside the house. This large scale observational study suggests that practices associated with higher levels of smoke are not associated with reduction in malaria acquisition risk among children living in sub Saharan Africa. Further mixed method research is required to better understand the relationship between malaria and household air pollution at a household and community level in this world region. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, malaria and air pollution is definitely a very interesting topic. Any questions for, for the presenter? Okay, thank you very much. So we'll continue to the next presentation. Hello, I'm Carolina and I'm going to present you my project entitled Aquas Two-Phase System from Liquid Liquid Extraction to Treat Desal Cultures. ATPS are classified as a type of liquid liquid extraction technique that involves combinations of polymer polymer at certain concentrations, giving rise to a top phase and a bottom phase. Therefore, the recovery and purification of biomolecular interest have been the main applications. Therefore, novel biotechnological applications towards tissue engineering have emerged, such as the construction of 3D cultures in which stem cells are encapsulated in polymer droplets distributed in defined patterns over another polymer and culture media. This technology enables the reproduction of cell niches, promoting cell-cell interactions, which ultimately results in higher cell viability and differentiation efficiency. This project aims to improve the construction of ATPS 3D cultures for the differentiation of IPCs into modern neurons. However, to achieve this, first, it is important to determine the optimal ATPS conditions prior stem cell encapsulation. Therefore, the experimental strategy starts with the construction of six different ATPS using these four polymers at different concentrations and molecular weights. Different combinations of polymers give rise to the two-phase formation, which is subsequently separated at the top-phase polymer and the bottom-phase polymer. The development of in vitro platforms consists in the generation of well-defined droplets, evaluating droplet size, number of droplets per well, and total volume. Also, three different strategies are tested, considering technical aspects that could affect droplet stability. 
which is further analyzed under microscopic evaluation. These outcomes correspond to an experiment in which only one droplet of 0.5 microliters is tested in the six ATPs using the three strategies. As you can see in strategy A, the observation of one defined droplet is present in ATPs 3, 4, 5, and 6. The same thing happens in strategy B. However, the presence of other small droplets is also observed in both strategies. Whereas for strategy C, one defined droplet is observed in the same ATPs. Comparing the three strategies, strategy C seems to promote droplet stability. In this context, small droplets of 0.5 microliters maintain greater stability than bigger droplets. The diameter of the droplets formed were measured in order to estimate their area size, varying in a range of 1,100 to 1,500 square millimeters. Regarding the ATPS evaluated, ATPS 3, 4, 5, and 6 showed better outcomes than 1 and 2. To achieve the translation from lab to clinic settings, the need for scalable technologies to obtain high efficiencies in cell proliferation and differentiation is crucial, in which the construction of ATPS criticultures stand as a promising strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carolina. Excellent presentation. Um, uh, one question from the public. What, what are other applications that you would, um, that would benefit from your methodology, ATPS? Hello everyone. Thank you for, for listening to my presentation. And thank you for the question, Dr. Cuevas. And the other applications that could uh, emerge from the methodology section. Uh, well, first of all, the, the aim of the project is to differentiate uh, IPCs or induced pluripotent stem cells to, to modern neurons. So the development of these in vitro platforms will allow further encapsulation of these stem cells and then will allow the differentiation uh, of these neurons. So that being said, these in vitro platforms will will be useful as a suitable platform for any other kind of cells. So it, it will be not limited to treat neurodegenerative diseases, but also to treat another kinds of, of, the, of human diseases. Okay, we have another question from the public. Um, what are the advantages versus 2D platforms? Okay, uh, that's an interesting question. Thank you for, for, for the question. Uh, the main advantages, uh, comparing 2D cultures versus uh, 3D cultures using Aquas 2 phase system, uh, is that it enables to, to reproduce a cell niches and this um, improves cell, cell interaction. So the very main uh, drawback of 2D cultures is that you can't reproduce physio physiological conditions of the human body because cells uh, are cultured over a plastic. So there's an, th there isn't a full interaction between cells. So that's why the, the 3D cultures using ATPS is an, a promising strategy because it enables that cells can interact with each other and allows the an, an appropriate or try to mimetize in vivo conditions more accurately. Okay, thank you very much, Carolina, for your presentation. Okay, we'll continue with the next uh, student presentation. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mary. I am a physiotherapist and a PhD student with University College Dublin in Ireland. So I'm going to be discussing you today the first part of my PhD research looking around the impact of training modes on fitness and anthropometry in women living with obesity. So to give you a bit of background and around the area, there's more than double the number of women living worldwide with obesity than there are men, and greater health risks are associated with female obesity, such as a higher prevalence of developing cancer, metabolic and cardiovascular diseases. Despite increasing literature that suggests that increasing cardiorespiratory fitness can attenuate a lot of these health risks, most of the research around women unfortunately focused primarily on weight loss. 
So our research focused on looking to assess what the most effective type of exercise mode is for improving cardiorespiratory fitness, body composition and metabolic health in women living with obesity. We conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis of RCTs published between 1988 and 2020. And we looked at specifically just women only studies which had participants aged between 18 to 65 with a BMI greater than 30 and no comorbidities. We looked at exercise only interventions so they couldn't be comp combined with diet and had to be compared with a control. Our results showed that there was only a small amount of literature available, so only 20 studies. The studies primarily focused on the lower scale of obesity, so around 31 kg. And they also focus primarily on younger women, so less than 45, 44 years old. The interventions, 65% were aerobic based interventions and there was few combined or resistance programs. All the control programs were supervised and the average dose was 3 by 47 minutes, so fairly close to generic uh, exercise clinical guidelines. In terms of the meta-analysis, our results showed that high intensity aerobic exercise was the most effective for fitness, weight loss and body fat. However, because there was such little data around resistance and combined programs, though they were very promising in a lot of these areas, it was underpowered. Therefore, our current main conclusions were that it's difficult to compare the different modes of exercise as there just isn't enough studies for resistance and combined interim types. So while aerobic exercise certainly appears to be the most effective at the moment, we just don't have enough information around resistance and combined programs. So the next step, therefore, is to get more research around uh, increasing fitness and steer the research away from weight loss women. Also, more research that will invest uh, resistance and combined exercise programs. So the next step in my PhD is to run the Exhibit trial, which is shown here, which will look at increasing the fitness of women living with obesity in the Dublin area um, and will investigate directly aerobic resistance and combined exercise. So thank you very much for your time. If you are interested, please get in contact. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, we have one question for the, from the public. Uh, wonderful job. Have you found any possible way to predict the impact of a specific, every specific intervention in a particular patient? Um, hello, so thank you very much for your question and thank you everyone for listening. So in terms of predicting how every possible variation of an intervention could work very fast and I think it's very individualized. So for, for instance, for uh, Exafit, all our programs will, will be individualized, but we are keeping it within specific intensities. So it is a set prescription. So we will be tracking it in that respect. So I don't think it is possible to predict how every specific intervention will work. But what we will do is we will be tracking um, what the different modes that they're using. So we can keep account of exercise intensity. We can keep account on, on how much kind of um, exercise, how much it'll cost them kind of uh, calories wise. So that might affect the weight loss. But I think that it might be beyond my scope to predict how every single intervention might affect every single, every particular patient. Thank you very much, Mary. Excellent presentation. Okay, so now we'll continue with the next uh, student presentation. Good morning. My name is uh, Linjo Joseph. I am a PhD student at um, University of Birmingham. Uh, my research topic is an exploration of patient health health records for handover communication and self-management in India. My research supervisors are Dr. Samira Manaseki Hall and Professor Sheila Greenfield, Anna Lavis, and Dr. Jimon Pandemakil. Um, So in today's presentation, I'd like to take you through four sections, the context for my research, research purpose, findings, and conclusion. So the context of my PhD research is in India. Uh, health systems such as in India, which are catered towards more acute healthcare conditions are not prepared for managing chronic healthcare conditions because poor, there is poor health integration between primary and healthcare uh, facilities, public and private healthcare facilities, and there is inadequate facility-based medical recording 
keeping, particularly in outpatient settings. This leads to inadequate handover across healthcare providers and across healthcare visits. Additionally, patients also shop around and self-refer themselves to different healthcare providers, leading to lack of information transfer across healthcare providers. Patients are usually given patient health, health records by the healthcare providers, which contain key medical information such as diagnosis, medication, and follow-up information. However, there is a research gap in terms of how useful are these records in terms of for patients' own use and also for healthcare providers in terms of information transfer. Therefore, my research aim is to explore the use of patient health health records for improving handover for healthcare providers and self-management for patients in India. For that, I went ahead and planned and conducted a qualitative study uh, in one of the states in India, Kerala. Kerala is the southernmost state in India, which has got healthcare indicators similar to that of higher income countries. However, it is um, uh, also burdened with uh, increasing prevalence of diabetes and hypertension and we use diabetes and hypertension as tracer conditions for chronic conditions for uh, and I interviewed patients, caregivers and healthcare providers in public health facilities and private facilities in Kerala. I completed 52 interviews and analyzed the data using thematic analysis uh, by, uh, as described by Braun and Clark. Uh, the analysis generated uh, three similar themes for uh, patients, caregivers, and healthcare providers, which describe their use in practice and perceived value of patient health record for themselves and uh, where practice and perceived value conflict. So uh, in detail, let's see the findings. So the healthcare providers felt that multiple care, uh, patient health records made it difficult to find the information. And they also uh, informed about the suboptimal recording due to the heavy patient load in outpatient departments. Uh, patients also make decisions on which healthcare, uh, which patient health record to carry based on which healthcare provider they are seeing. Uh, Caregivers felt that um, patients uh, need to carry all the records to the patient health, uh, all consultations. Perceived value for themselves. Uh, healthcare providers felt that these records help them in their clinical uh, decision making and therefore they valued them for preventing medication errors and improving patient safety. Uh, while patients saw them as only documents or uh, tools which help them to procure medicines. And interestingly, the health care givers felt that these are useful in emergency health care visit. Both health care providers and patients did not see much of value in uh, self-care management using patient health records. But um, caregivers felt that there is some value in involving uh, in patients' care uh, using patient health records. So in conclusion, current uh, patient health records are not functioning fully for uh, information transfer, nor are they uh, very useful for self-management in the view of patients and healthcare providers. Uh, yet patients carry them to consultations and caregivers value the medical information. So what are these implications for uh, my research? Um, one of the main implications is that uh, patient health records can be used for prevention of medication errors and improving patient safety. Therefore, the awareness regarding them should be increased. And human-centered design for better patient health records may be used for uh, patients with lower literacy for uh, self-management. I thank all research participants for giving me their valuable time and insight. And I thank the U21 doctoral forum for giving me an opportunity for uh, making this presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Lin Yu, for your presentation. Um, any questions from the public? Okay, um, so there's a question uh, for Lin Yu. Do you, uh, within the part of your of your PhD, uh, have you thought about the the important parts of this patient health record that that should be included? 
like the minimum parts that should be in this record? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, uh, we did have a uh, discussion with the healthcare providers in terms of what should be the minimum uh, information in these uh, records. And what, uh, from the discussions, what have come about is at least uh, for the purpose of information transfer, we need diagnosis uh, and the medications of the patient and at least their follow-up information so that the patient will be able to come back and that would be useful for other healthcare providers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Linyu. Um, if there are any more questions, you're welcome to go and contact the student through, their, through her poster. Okay, so we'll continue with the next presentation. Camargo Fajardo, Therapeutic Education by e-learning for asthma control in pediatric patients and their caregivers. What is the chronic non-communicable disease, CND? World Health Organization says that CND, like asthma, has some characteristics developed in long life process, spend a lot of resources, and CND can be controlled by therapeutic patient education. What is therapeutic patient education? Empower people with CND to manage the illness and yield benefits in health, financial time, and quality lifetime. Objective, design and validate a system in model based on learning object for the TPAM at Mexican pediatric patient between five to seven years old with asthma and a primary caregiver for self-management of the illness. We use many methodology, technicals and theories for design a TPA in learning courses. First step, we center in the pediatric patient and primary caregiver requirements. We talk with patient, caregivers, doctors, nurses, psychologists, nutritionists, and social workers in the Instituto Nacional de Enfermedades Respiratorias. With all of the information, we built a problematic situation with SSM. Second step, we use the instructional design theory and adapted an ADI model. Third step, we built a TPA in learning courses structure based on learning object. Learning object is the unit of information that the student needs to learn. You can observe our TPA in learning courses structure. It has 21 learning objects. After we tolerate the TPA knowledge with our storytelling, health serial game, and we illustrated with multimedia resources. Finally, we join everything as a TPA e-learning courses. Then we plan it to test the TPA e-learning courses intervention design. Results. On day one, the intervention group had an 11 ACTC value point average on control. And after 30 days of the TPA courses, this average increased to 22 ACT points average, which corresponded to control as you can see blue line. By the contrary, control group in the red line started with 17 ST points average and after 13 days increases to 20 ACT points average, only three points more without the, the intervention. Conclusion, the intervention carry with TPA e-learning courses focus on CND, allow the patient and the caregiver identify the symptoms, recognize the triggers, apply the, their knowledge uh, of the procedure and make decision about their own condition. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Um, any questions from the public? So I have uh, one question for you. Are there other uh, diseases that that would be would benefit from this from this technology from the TPAE learning? Hi everybody. Sure, you can use this model with another kinds of chronic disease. For example, este, diabetes, uh, heart, uh, heart illness, but we need to develop others, others um, learning object to be, um, be included for that uh, or those uh, uh, illness and my 
I want to continue to, to develop that the learning object. Now I am trying to develop learning object of the COVID because the, the people and the childhood doesn't understand what's the important is to prevent for the COVID. And now I am focused in COVID. Excellent, excellent, Maria. Uh, are you, one, one additional question, are you planning on including these uh, media presentations in, in an iPhone app or in a YouTube uh, platform? Now, uh, this, uh, this app is uh, for the cells, but now I am Instituto Politécnico Nacional is closed and uh -huh. I couldn't to register the app, but I pray to Lord and say in a few moments, in a few time, I register it and I will give to the Instituto Nacional de Enfermedades Respiratorias to, to share with them the asthma app. And I, I will, I will to continue developing the learning object because the, the medical personnel don't have um, tools to, to teach the, the, the patient and their uh, first giver to, to control and to prevent the, the illness. So I, I love this, I love this. I am not a, a doctor, I am an engineer, but I love it, I love it. Mm -hmm. Excellent, Maria. This is why this field is a very multidisciplinary. And yes, it's, it is. Yes, it's a, a, a great job you're doing. Congratulations, okay. and we wish you the best love. You, it has a big potential. Thank you, thank you, and I, I love it. I love it, help you or help the medical personnel because you have a lot of problems. You, you need to check the, the patient and the mother and the, and the inter, inter yes. consult and you need to have time to, or, or have um, tools to resolve the problem and prevent the problems. <laughs> exactly, that's <laughs> excellent, excellent job. Thank you Thank for you. working on this. Okay. Bye. See you. We'll continue with the next presentation. Thank you very much, Maria. Hello, my name is Daniel Martinez Ramirez, and I will talk to you about my research project, Predictive Factors of These Autonomias in Parkinson's Disease. And this is the outline uh, of my presentation. So uh, we know that Parkinson's disease is the second most common neurodegenerative disorder worldwide. And uh, it's the highest uh, neurological disease with the highest growth in the last years. It's characterized with a by, uh, by a variety of motor and unmotor symptoms. But most importantly, we have seen that when these non-motor symptoms um, such as dementia, dysautonomias, psychosis, and, and mood disorders are present, uh, patients have a, a, a worse quality of life, lower functionality, increasing the risk of morbidity and mortality. Specifically, these autonomias, uh, this has been reported, uh, age, deceleration, cognitive impairment, depression, and sleep disorders as pretty factors of these symptoms. And the I symptoms have been reported as the most common dysautonomic symptom in early stages of the disease. So in our research project, we want to uh, identify factors that are associated with these uh, symptoms in our population. Mm -hmm. And this will help us uh, to gain a better understanding of the clinical profile. And in this way, we can focus uh, theories or, or implement early intervention uh, strategies to prevent these uh, diseases or disorders. These autonomias are common the most common symptoms are cardiovascular, GI, urinary, sexual, etc. And 40 to 85 percent are present with these symptoms. And constipation is, has been the GI symptom most commonly reported 
previously, even in a premotor stages. As we mentioned previously, when this autonomy is present, uh, patients have negative outcomes and, and research has been mainly focused on cardiovascular and DI symptoms. So we wanted to study uh, these autonomies in early stages. So we use a PPMI cohort where we found that urinary symptoms were really, really common, more common than GI symptoms in early stages of the disease. Uh, and the most prevalent symptom was nocturia. So what can we say with this uh, result? We can mention that these autonomias are common in early stages of Parkinson's disease. Urinary and GI symptoms are prevalent and frequent. Urinary are really common and the predictive factors that we found were fatigue, sleep disorders, impulsivity, and age. And the presence of this autonomy seems to be uh, uh, associated to a more aggressive type of disease. So uh, future perspective, we want to continue studying uh, this uh, type of phenotype of Parkinson's disease, collaborating with a uh, large PD cohort. And we want to study uh, these autonomias with sleep disorders and olfactory impairment in Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease to see if we can distinguish uh, PD with atypical Parkinson's disease. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Daniel. Uh, so there's a question from the group. What are the future directions and impact of your investigation? Hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Daniel Martinez from Monterrey, Mexico. So. Uh, I'm really interested in this autonomy as in, in Parkinson's disease. Uh, I mean, we have learned that these symptoms uh, can present early in the course of the disease, but there is another uh, disorder that presents uh, with very similar uh, characteristics that is called uh, multiple system atrophy. But nowadays we don't have a, a, a tool to distinguish these two disorders. So my uh, future of this project, of, of this line of uh, research is to find a clinical uh, predictor of multiple system atrophy. So uh, there is a group in, in London that they are working on, on, on detecting olfactory impairment. And uh, there is a theory that the patients with Parkinsonism and dysautonomias without uh, olfactory impairment can uh, progress to a multi multiple system atrophy. So that will be our next project. We want to distinguish this patient, this profile of this autonomous and Parkinsonism. And then we are going to, uh, to measure uh, olfactory uh, olfaction or smell. Uh, and we're going to uh, follow them and then we will uh, try to see if this can be a predictor of, of the future progression of these two disorders. Thank you very much, Daniel. Excellent work. We'll continue with the next presentation. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to present results of our study where we looked at the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on people and children with CF and their families. This is a study conducted jointly between UCD and Cystic Fibrosis Island, the support and advocacy organization for people with CF. I am a PhD student funded through a grant from Health Research Board. A self-administered questionnaire developed by UCD and Cystic Fibrosis Island was hosted and advertised by Cystic Fibrosis Island to the CF community by their website and social media in the months of October and November 2020. The total number of participants was 242, 119 were adults with CF and 123 were parents of children with CF. Looking at the table on the top left, 47.5% of PWCF and 55% of children had visits deferred during the pandemic. Looking at the figure on the right, the majority of children had a deferral for three months and majority of adults had a deferral for six months or above. The figure below left shows the key reasons of deferral, which were fear of COVID-19 and closure of hospital unit. This slide looks at the medical care of PWCF during the first year of pandemic. The column graphs at the top row shows the numbers and the cluster bar shows the experience, from very useful to not at all useful. First, looking at the top left, online consultations were new to around half of the population and majority of them found it helpful for them. 
Looking at the second bar above, overall around 53% of them received their prescriptions via email and those who did more than 80% found it beneficial for them. The third and the fourth bar shows that relatively smaller number of adults used online education or online physiotherapy classes and those who did found it really helpful. This slide looks at the medical care of children with CF during the first year of pandemic. The slide is set out in the same way as the last one. First, looking at the online consultation and the children on the top left, we can see online consultation was new and some parents found it helpful for them. Looking at the second bar above, overall around 55% of parents received their child's prescription via email and those who did more than 80% found it beneficial for them. The third and the fourth bar show that a smaller number of parents and children used online education and online physiotherapy classes, but those who did found it really helpful. We did not find any significant differences between adults and children with regard to consultation results. We looked at the availability of medicines and PPE and found that 13% of parents of CWCF and 30% of PWCF found it challenging to access medicines or treatments for cystic fibrosis of whom one child with CF and seven adults with CF had to stop taking medicines and had to find an alternative. We found that most were happy with the availability of PPE and use of hand sanitizers. This slide looks at the impact of COVID-19 on mental health. The graph on the left shows that 74% of adults experience issues related to mental health during the pandemic. 71% of children with CF were deemed by their parents to have suffered issues related to mental health. Looking at the graph on the right, the key mental health issues by both adults and children were increased anxiety and stress. After adjustment for gender and work, younger adults were three times more likely to have negative feelings. Overall, delays in hospital visits is of great concern as routine examination is the key to early intervention in infective exacerbations or picking up of any other signs of clinical deterioration. Prescription via email was also popular. COVID-19 pandemic also had a serious impact on mental health of adults with CF, children with CF and their parents. Finally, I would like to thank those who participated in the study, Cystic Fibrosis Island and Health Research Board. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your presentation, Rini. There's a question from the uh, public. They want to know uh, what could be the potential reason behind such a large number of people reporting difficulty in accessing medicine. Uh, hello, good morning. Am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, thank you so much for the question and thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to uh, present my work. So, uh, regarding the question, the key uh, reason for difficulty in accessing medication during the pandemic was that there was an uh, issue in supply of Creon, which is a drug which is used to treat uh, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency in adults and children with CF. So, this drug is taken with food and it helps in digestion and the dose depends upon the amount of food eaten the meal eaten. So for approximately two months, the Creon 25,000 was not available in Ireland. However, Creon 10,000 was available and pharmacists were giving Creon 10,000 to the parents and they were giving an advice on how to calculate the dosage. Also, as uh, they were at home and uh, you know they were cocooning so they were at home and they were eating more frequently and the amount of food was also uh, like you know uh, more as compared to the pre uh, pandemic period so that's why it was observed that around 20 th that there was around 25 percent of uh, increase in uh, the need of crayon per person uh, during the pandemic as compared to before pandemic and also some people uh, during the initial weeks actually of the pandemic some people were left out and they were not uh, uh, you know they, they would not have access to the crayon drug Okay, excellent work, Rini. Um, we would need to continue with other with the next Thank presentation. You so much. If Thank you, you so have, much. Uh, there are other questions from from the public. Please address uh, the author directly through her poster. Thank you very much. Next presentation.
Hello, my name is Katia Milner and I'm a final year PhD candidate based at the University of Nottingham in the UK in the Department of Medicine and Health Sciences. And I'm going to talk very briefly today about my PhD research, which is exploring the role of spirituality in mental health and recovery. So what do we mean by spirituality? Well, it's a very broad concept, which includes both religious and non-religious expressions. Essentially, it's about what gives us meaning and purpose in life and about how we make sense of the world around us. Within the context of research, there's been a growing interest in spirituality research, including the relationship between spirituality and mental health. Clearly, mental health is of increasing concern, particularly within the current COVID context. There's also been large scale empirical evidence demonstrating positive health outcomes in relation to spirituality and mental health. But despite this, research has also indicated a gap in clinical practice, which it calls a religiosity gap. So how can we bridge this religiosity gap so that clinicians can better understand this dimension? Well, my research is looking at how we can improve understanding of people's own lived experiences of spirituality and mental health through a qualitative systematic review and a narrative study. And I'm going to talk just very briefly about the findings of the qualitative systematic review. The review looked at the experiences of spirituality and mental health in adults in past peer-reviewed um, research and the results of the thematic synthesis identified six key themes which created the acronym MYSTIC. The themes are meaning making, identity, service provision, talk about it, interaction with symptoms and coping and you can find out more about this study in the reference provided at the bottom of the slide. A key aim of this framework and the study was to make the topic of spirituality and mental health easier to understand and to open up conversation and reflection about it. To support this aim, I created a user-friendly resource, one for general well-being, which is so shown on this slide with some reflective questions around each theme and one for clinicians to help them to understand the clinical relevance of each of the themes and some clinical approaches and questions that they might ask to clients that they're working with. And you can access this toolkit at the link at the bottom of the slide. So thank you very much for listening. You can find out more about this study in the articles provided at the bottom of the slide, or do feel free to contact me on my email shown here on the slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Katia. This is very, very interesting uh, work. Mm, very much needed in these COVID times. Okay, any questions from the public? Okay, so we'll continue with the next presentation. Well, hold on, there's a question for, from the public. They are asking if, if this toolkit is calibrated for incurable diseases. Hi there, thank you very much for your question. Um, if it's calibrated for incurable diseases, it was based actually on the qualitative systematic review, which uh, included uh, qualitative studies that asked people about their own lived experiences of spirituality and mental health. So it reflects people what people said about what was important to them uh, within their own lived experiences. So that might have included um, different types of mental health diagnoses or being within different mental health contexts. So it's not specific to a particular disease or illness, but in general, um, within a sort of general mental health context. And it's aimed for that kind of, it helps really for it to be more accessible uh, across different contexts, but certainly, um, trying to refine it to different contexts and, and different illnesses might be some work for the future. Yeah, thank you for your question. Thank you very much. We'll continue thank with the you. next presentation. Hello, everyone. Thank you for giving me this wonderful opportunity to share my research. 
Let me start by saying just a few words about myself. I'm Eun Go, a doctoral student in nursing at Korea University in Korea. I'm very interested in the relationship of my nurses. My treasure is two lovely sons in this picture. So without further delay, let me jump right into what I tried to accomplish with the study. During this COVID-19 pandemic, I've done a study concept analysis of a colleague's study TJ can be observable among Korean nurses who were at the front line to fight against the COVID-19. The purpose of my study was to explore the experience of colleagues of the team and nurses who cared for patients infected with COVID-19. A hybrid model method was used to investigate the dimensions, activities, and definitions of the concept. As a result, the concept of colleagues solidarity among the nurses was found to have three dimensions with 11 activities. The three dimensions emerged from this analysis were interaction, motivation, and relationship. The first dimension called the interaction had four activities as voluntary support, mutual respect, open communication, and virtual soccer. The second dimension named motivation had four activities of collaboration, sharing sense of communion and calling. The last dimension relationship had three activities to unique, mutually equal relationship and comradeship. Under the overwhelming and uncertain situation of the COVID-19 pandemic, the calling solidarity defined in my study was based on a sense of communion and calling that helped to nurses achieve a common goal by having mutual relationship and comradeship and developing collaboration and sharing through voluntary support, mutual respect of communication and virtual circle. Although the calling was not entirely seen or heard during the interviews with these nurses, uh, this concept analysis showed they played a key role in sustaining the colleague solidarity and uniting its activities to work together. In conclusion, the colleague made their colleague solidarity unique and different from other professionals. Thank you for listening. Great presentation. Thank you very much. Any questions from the public? Okay, so we'll continue with the, with our next presentation. Next presentation, yes, thank you. Hello, my name is Lorna Hollowood and I'm a part-time PhD student in the School of Nursing at the University of Birmingham. I'm also a full-time lecturer in nursing. My PhD is about the experiences of the Windrush generation living in UK care homes. No one really wants to think about living in a care home, but trends show that by 2030, 2040, less than 20 years away, most people will in fact end their lives in one. The care home population are a vulnerable group, Advanced age, frailty, multimorbidities and the increasing prevalence of dementia all contribute to this vulnerability. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the care home sector has highlighted the extent of those vulnerabilities to us all, with up to a third of COVID-related deaths in the first wave of the pandemic in the UK affecting care home residents. My research seeks to explore the experiences of the Windrush generation in UK care homes a group vulnerable by their intersectionality of being care home residents and from black African and Caribbean backgrounds. Census data tells us that only 3% of care home residents are currently from ethnic minority backgrounds, so it's not a lot of people, but this number will increase and it is no excuse for a complete lack of research focused on their needs. What we do know is that there are significant, significant inequalities and disparities in the end of life care provision to ethnic elders. My qualitative study seeks to collate the narratives of this group to inform an evidence base for culturally competent care home provision. The study is being conducted within a criticalist philosophical framework, the silences framework, which will advocate for and uncover the perspectives of this marginalised group. 
my systematic scoping review explores the experiences of ethnic minorities in long-term care settings across the world. The results have demonstrated the importance of cultural values and beliefs in providing a focus for care planning, how we communicate with our elders and in what languages, and unsurprisingly, the importance of food in enhancing and maintaining quality of life. It has also shown that there are gaps in the evidence about end of life care quality outcomes, such as, such as advanced care planning conversations, asking people about how they wish to be cared for at the end of life and how cultural beliefs and values can be incorporated to enhance care. These gaps will be explored in my conversations with care home residents and their families, and this will inform interventions to ensure all of our elders can experience high quality care at the end of life. Please see my email address to contact me for further discussion. Excellent work, Lorna. Thank you very much. So, uh, we have any questions from the public? Okay, so we'll continue with our next presenter. Hello everyone, I'm Bianca Rodriguez and I'm a PhD student in health research methodology at McMaster University in Canada. Today I will be presenting preliminary findings from a methodological review on the outcomes reported in randomized control trials for geriatric patients with depression. Randomized control trials are considered the gold standard in assessing the effectiveness of interventions used to treat depression. However, heterogeneity in the outcomes used to measure intervention success across trials makes it challenging to compare results between studies and has limited utility for clinical decision making. One proposed solution to addressing this heterogeneity is the development of a core outcome set that represents the minimum set of outcomes which must be reported in trials. There is presently no core outcome set for geriatric patients with depression. As this clinical population is unique due to the comorbidities that accompany aging, this must be considered in treatment choices and therefore reflected in the outcomes used to assess intervention effectiveness. Our objective represents the first step towards the development of a core outcome set and we conducted a methodological review on the outcomes reported in trials of older adults aged 60 and over with a diagnosis of depression in trials published over the past 10 years. We followed similar methodology to that used by systematic reviews. We did not place restrictions on the types of interventions or comparators and abstracted outcomes related to effectiveness. We map these outcomes to five core outcome domains standard for other core outcome set initiatives. This screening is still ongoing. We have identified 25 studies for inclusion thus far. These 25 trials reported on 68 total outcomes, which we synthesized into 13 unique outcome terms. These 13 unique outcome terms mapped to three core domains physiological clinical, life impact, and mortality survival. Resource use and adverse events were the two outcome domains that were left completely unexamined. The most frequently reported outcome was depressive symptom severity, as reported by 23 studies. Ten different measurement instruments were used to assess the single outcome of depressive symptom severity. Findings suggest that there is considerable range and variability in the outcomes reported across trials, which limits the ability to translate findings into clinical practice. Furthermore, given that two domains were left completely unexamined, it is clear that trialists are not selecting outcomes based on what is most useful to evidence users. Finally, Depressive symptom severity was assessed using 10 different measurement instruments, which creates challenges for synthesizing information across trials, given the lack of content overlap among common depression scales. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Bianca. So, um, any questions from the public? One of the questions I are you planning on, on publishing the results of the meta analysis with the clinical trials? Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you so much for this question. So we are pub we are planning on publishing our methodological review when it's completed. It won't really be synthesized as a meta-analysis. It'll be synthesized as a methodological review, and we'll be mapping the outcomes reported and uh, kind of quantifying the heterogeneity uh, between the outcomes uh, used in, across the different trials. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Mianka, very much. So next presenter, please. My name is Egeta Kilishek. I'm a PhD candidate in Dr. Sheila Singh's lab at McMaster University in Ontario, Canada, and my thesis focuses on inhibiting the formation of brain metastasis with small molecules. Brain metastasis are the most common tumors of the central nervous system, most commonly spreading from primary lung, breast, and melanoma tumors. They are associated with very poor survival rates of four to 12 months after diagnosis. And this is largely because current therapies are inefficient at completely eradicating the cancer cells after the established brain metastasis. We in the lab receive surgically excised tumor tissue samples directly from the clinic and establish them into cell lines in vitro. We use these cell lines to model brain metastasis in vivo by injecting them into the orthotopic site of a mouse depending on the primary tumor of origin. When we inject these cells orthotopically, the mice succumb to primary tumor burden before we're able to visualize full-blown brain tumors. However, when we analyze these brains with more sensitive methods, such as fluorescence-activated cell sorting, we see a very small population of human cells in these mouse brains, which leads us to believe that we isolate them at the pre-metastatic stage, which means they have just crossed the blood-brain barrier but not yet had enough time to form brain metastasis. RNA sequencing tells us that premetastatic brain metastasis cells have a very distinct genetic profile compared to their established brain metastasis tumor counterparts. Mining this genetic profile has led us to wonder if we can target the premetastatic stage and prevent brain metastasis from forming altogether. There are almost 4,000 commonly deregulated genes among premetastatic lung, breast, and melanoma brain metastasis cells. We used this as a query signature for connectivity map analysis, which pointed us towards six drugs that significantly inhibit the cell viability of our brain metastasis cells in vitro. One of these drugs, drug A, affects the cell viability of lung, breast, and melanoma brain metastasis cells in vitro, but does not have any effect on our neural stem cell controls. This drug also imparts a significant survival advantage when administered to mice in vivo compared to placebo. Overall, drugs that target brain metastasis progression specifically at the premetastatic stage could slow or even prevent tumor formation and transform a fatal systemic disease into an eminently more treatable one. Thank you to the Singh Lab and all of its sponsors for supporting this work and to the Doctoral Forum Student Committee for selecting me to present this talk today. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have a question from the public. Do you have any further information on the subtype of the cell lines you employed? Okay, I think the presenter is not within the audience. So we'll continue with the, our next presenter. Good afternoon. My name is Lydia Mutale, professional nurse from South Africa. My study is on strategies to attain and retain community health nurses in the primary health care sector. The introduction of the program on community health nurses is a positive move towards a healthcare in South Africa, and it has been welcomed by all the parties, all stakeholders, since it's going to address all the shortages of nurses in the public health sector. As South Africa is preparing for the national health insurance, the introduction of these cadres at primary health care will bear a positive fruit. The problem statement is to say, how do we retain the primary healthcare nurses 
to ensure that the policies that has been implemented on the community health nursing services in the public health sector bear a positive fruit. The research question is, what can be done to ensure that community health services nursing professionals stay in the primary health care center on completion of one year compulsory community services? The research purpose is to develop a framework as a reference for the strategies to attain and retain community service nursing professionals in the primary health care services in Houghton province in Ekuruland Health District. The objective of the research is to explore and describe the experiences of the community service nursing professionals working in the primary health care setting to develop a conceptual framework from the results of the experiences of the community service nursing professionals to develop and describe the strategies derived from the conceptual framework to attain and retain community service nursing professionals in the primary health care services. A qualitative, explorative, descriptive, and contextual research design using a phenomenological method to facilitate a systematic naturalistic inquiry was used during the research study. Sampling, a purposive sampling was used. Data was collected through in-depth phenomenological individual and focus group interview. Data analysis was through using GOG and Colanzi stages of descriptive methods of data analysis. Trustworthiness, that is credibility of the study, authenticity, applicability, dependability, and transferability was adhered to. The ethical principles were adhered through throughout the study by ensuring that the principles of beneficence, non-maleficence, justice, and respect for all participants were applied. There is Search came up with three to four themes as follows. The first theme is working environment. Participants experienced uh, overwhelmed by the number of patients that they were consulting on daily basis, meaning that the environment was not conducive. There was a challenge of human resource challenges, shortages, physical environment in theme two, Training and knowledge was a challenge, especially that the participants were exposed to theoretical training. So there was a need for on-site or clinical training, a need for in-service training, a need for exposure to the three streams of care. Team three, the participants experienced lack of support and supervision, where as new fights in the new nursing profession and in the clinical practice, they needed to be accompanied and to be super, supervised and supported. Category four, they were also not uh, uh, content with the, the placement procedure. As you know that in South Africa, we've got three levels of care, that is primary health care, secondary, and tertiary. As they highlighted that some of them, they have applied to be placed at secondary, not primary health care. Hence, that's, that's the reason they were not staying at the primary health care services. These are some of the codes which they shared. For example, there were too many patients to be seen. For example, they couldn't cope with the nurse patient ratio of 60 patients per nurse. They had a challenges with the integrated management of childhood illnesses, especially that at primary health care level, it's a nurse-based uh, environment. Physical environment, a challenge of uh, infrastructure where there was a lack of privacy, a challenge of lack of resources and equipments. For example, equipments like um, personal protective equipment, the safety and security. As you know that at primary health care, there would be some challenges with the communities who would attack nurses as and when there are challenges with uh, delayed care Healthcare. Theme two, training and gaining knowledge. They wanted to be trained on the practical issue. For example, when it comes to expanded um, program on immunization, they had the theory on EPI. They asked us to say, how best can we be able to implement this theory into practice? As newly qualified professional nurses, they had limited experience 
and they needed to be accompanied, especially on primary health care, as I've reiterated that that is a nurse-based uh, environment. Exposure to three streams, they needed to be exposed to integration, for example, not to be doing only one stream, which is maternal child and women's health, but to also to be able to do the acute and chronic care and also the other uh, programs. Team three, lack of support and supervision. They did uh, emphasize that they need to be orientated on the policies, protocols, and procedures for them to be um, abreast of the new developments and to be able to manage their patients. Some of them, they said, it hurts me. If there are mistakes, they point at me as a comsef, meaning that as a, a newly qualified nurse, I don't know why. They always leave me on Friday afternoon to work alone. Those are some of the sentiments which were shared by the participant. Placement procedure, as I have highlighted that some of them, they would want to be placed at secondary where there's more support of the multidisciplinary team with the doctors and other uh, members of the team. But in the primary health care center, they felt that at primary health care, they have to be independent, even if they were not yet efficient. Identification of the central concept. There was a lack of conducive working environment, a lack of training and gaining knowledge, lack of support and supervision, and lack of clarity. And from this concept, there was a need for facilitation of a conducive working environment, facilitation of a training and gaining knowledge of support and supervision of this participant, and also on clarity and proper placement of the participants if they have applied. These are the themes that uh, were identified in the study. Definition of conceptual framework. It was, the conceptual framework was actually based on the DICOF at R elements of to determine the agent, the recipient context, and the terminus procedure and the dynamics of the conceptual framework. This is the conceptual framework which was uh, developed the road, the actual roadmap of the researcher. For example, when you look at the primary agents, you are looking at the National Department of Health, the South African Nursing Council as the primary agents, and the secondary agent is the, the district management and the primary health care professional nurses and the participants will be the recipients together with the uh, professional nurses who are supposed to supervise them. Our procedure will be facilitation of quality care. And when you look at the dynamic, we find that the dynamics will be experiences of com compromised quality care due to lack of the three areas of gaining knowledge, support and supervision, conducive environment, and placement procedure. The context is the primary health care facilities in the city of Egruleni. And the terminus will be the strategies to attain and retain community service nursing professionals in the primary health care. This is a conceptual framework. During the conceptual framework, according to DCOF, at R, we are now looking at uh, the three phases. That is the relationship phase, the working phase, the termination phase, so that we must come up with the, uh, the actual attaining and retaining of our nurses in the primary health care services. In conclusion, participants highlighted daunting experiences in the primary health care facilities during compulsory community services. Hence, they were not staying in the primary health care when they complete the one year compulsory community services. The findings will be integrated into relevant literature to provide a thick description of the meaning of the experiences of compulsory community services. It is from this meaning that the conceptual framework 
from the results of the experiences of the community service nursing professionals have been developed and the strategies will be prevented, which are going to assist in ensuring that we retain and attain the community service nursing professionals in the primary health care services in on conclusion of the one year compulsory community services in order for the implementation of the policy to benefit the consumers of healthcare services in South Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, so one question, how many people, uh, how many, uh, yeah, how many people were interviewed for this research? Thank you very much. The total number of participants, it was a 34 of nurses who were placed for compulsory community services in 2017. There were males and females and all the race groups were involved. 34 a total. Thank you. Excellent job, Lydia. Thank you very much for sharing with us. Okay, so we'll continue with the next presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Sohal Harbi. I am a fourth year PhD student at the University of Nottingham. Today I will talk about part of my research which titled Exploring Public Attitude Toward Digitizing Community Pharmacy Services. Digital health could solve the problem of increasing pressure on the pharmacist which could lead to reduce waiting time and provide more options for the public. Investigating the general public attitude to digital health system is an important area for research. Therefore, this project aims to explore public attitudes toward using digital health system to deliver some community pharmacy services. To fulfill this aim, I use a sequential explanatory mixed method approach with adapted validated online survey and telephone interview. In terms of quantitative results, 208 responses were available for analysis with a response rate of 20%. Regarding the characteristic of the sample size, 59% of the participants were female. Almost half of the participants were aged between 18 and 24 years old. Most of the participants were happy to consider using an online pharmacy to order prescription. Also, 72% of the participants considered the use of the mobile health application which use artificial intelligence to identify or treat minor ailment. Considering the age, as you see in the chart, there was high tendency in the participant less than 35 years old to use digital health, while the preference to use teleconsultation was quite low among the participants. Regarding the role of the community pharmacist in health promotion, 71% of the participants agreed on the usefulness of the social media campaign to increase their awareness of relevant health issues. In terms of qualitative results, 12 participated in semi-structure interviews. Overall, these participants were positive about digitalizing the community pharmacy services, and two main themes were evident. The first one is the advantages of using the digital health in delivering community pharmacy services, and three sub-themes were emerged, which includes privacy, convenience, and safe time. While only one disadvantage was recognized by the participant, which include the unreliability of digital health. To conclude, most of the participants were positive about using digital health in relation to the community pharmacy services. However, their opinion could be changed in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you so much for your listening. Thank you very much, Suha. Very interesting presentation. So, um, one question: How would you, how do you think uh, managing the the use of antibiotics and restricted drugs would work uh, using this digital um, application? Uh, hello. Um, yes. 
I'm not so sure like uh, we can use like uh, a digital incubation or all the services of the community pharmacy. My work is only focusing on like online pharmacy. So you can just like uh, deliver the online uh, prescription or like for advice or uh, teleconsultation. You know, it's like uh, the pharmacy is really busy all the time. So if we have the option for providing online consultation, this is, will be great. As you can see in the advantages, people say like this is good space time and it will be more flexible for people. So I think at the beginning, we just like um, focusing and delivering advice or uh, consultation or delivering uh, uh, like the prescription. Okay, exactly. Thank you very much. So let's go on to the next presentation. Hi, my name is Leslie Uribe. I'm a pediatric oncologist and medical clinical science PhD student at Tecnológico de Monterrey. I'd like to present my project, which is titled Perspectives on Assessment of Nutritional Status in Children and Adolescents with Acute Lymphoblastic Leukemia, a challenge faced by pediatric hematology and oncology centers in low and middle income countries. So in last years, obesity has been identified as an adverse prognostic factor in children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Despite this, currently not all pediatric hematology and oncology centers in low and middle income countries, such as Mexico, assess nutritional status of children with cancer at diagnosis or during treatment. So, we studied Mexican pediatric hematologist oncologist perceptions regarding nutritional assessment, clinical outcomes, and strategies to reduce obesity in children with ALL. So, we conducted this study by using a printed survey, which was answered by 71 pediatric hematologist oncologists around our country. And the results we had regarding these three areas were the following. Regarding the area of nutritional assessment, 79% of participants stated having access to the expertise of a nutritional specialist in their workplace. Regarding clinical outcomes, all of them consider obesity as a risk factor for treatment-related toxicity, 70% for relapse, and 95% for mortality in children with ALL. And regarding strategies to reduce obesity centered ar around using patient and parent guidelines on nutrition, as well as pediatric hematology oncology guidelines on diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up of obesity in children with cancer. So we concluded that while subspecialists recognize the importance of obesity in clinical outcome of children with ALL, yet there is a lack of addressing nutritional status during pediatric cancer treatment in some centers. So we suggest an advice on strategies to face this challenge by subspecialists considering that a multidisciplinary effort and continuing education is required, as well as implementing nutritional guidelines to improve and maintain nutritional status of children with cancer. Thank you very much, Leslie. Excellent work. Um, so one question uh, is, are you planning on, on publishing the results of this uh, research that you did? Okay, I think um, the presenter is not in the public. So let's continue with our next presentation. about medications after an acute myocardial infarction, or AMI. This is a lengthy process as there are often multiple new medications. Additionally, these patients are at risk of medication harm as they are often older, have multiple comorbidities and high levels of polypharmacy. 
However, although these patients are known to have high rates of rehospitalization, the role that medication harm plays is poorly explored. So what is medication harm? It is any negative patient outcome related to medication use, irrespective of severity or preventability. In this retrospective cohort study, we investigated the incidence, type, timing, and severity of medication harm causing unplanned rehospitalization after an AMI. We use clinical coding and case mix data reports to identify those who were rehospitalized within 18 months of their AMI. Medication harm rehospitalizations were identified using clinician medical record review and clinical coding data. Severity assessments of identified medication harm were undertaken using published scales. So what did we find? There were 1,564 patients with an index AMI admission. 418 of these were rehospitalized, and of these, 89 patients were found to have 101 medication harm events. The most common events were gastrointestinal bleeds, acute kidney injury, and hypotension. Bruzamide, antiplatelets, and perindopril were the most commonly implicated medications, and this matches with the common events seen in medication harm literature. In terms of timing, there was a median time to medication harm rehospitalization of 79 days, with 75% of the events occurring by the six month mark. Rash, syncope, dyspnea, and gastrointestinal bleeding occurred more commonly in the first one to two months of discharge. There was a greater spread in the timeline to acute kidney injury and hypertension, and this could potentially be explained by the up titration of antihypertensives or the prescription of diuretics for patients with subsequent heart failure. The majority of events were classified as serious, and there were eight life-threatening events, including angioedema caused by perindopril. In conclusion, the three key takeaways are that approximately one-fifth of rehospitalized AMI patients experienced medication harm. The first six months after discharge is a high-risk time for medication harm and should be the focus of harm mitigation strategies. These could include empowering patients to recognize medication harm and stringent and timely monitoring. Ultimately, this study is the first step towards enhancing medication management for our patients like Mr. MI. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. So one, one question. Um, how would you lower this um, rehospitalization due to uh, medication harm? How, how, what would be some um, methods to lower this percent? Okay, uh, presenter is not in the public. So let's continue with our next presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Mahnaz Tajik. I'm a PhD student under Dr. Nosworthy's supervision and today I will be present our work related to the genomics and metabolomics analysis in patients following mild traumatic brain injury. Mild TBI is caused by below to the head or sudden acceleration decoloration movement. This type of brain damage can lead to cellular and molecular injury cascade which reflect functional disturbance rather than a structural injury. The result of that might be involved loss of consciousness, or in some cases, no abnormality detected by a standard neuroimaging technique. In this study, we applied various bioinformatic databases to confirm how many genes are significantly related to the mite TBI. To show specificity of our candidate genes in relation to the mite TBI, to find out which molecular function and biological pathway they are engaged, show protein-protein interaction and co-expression between our candidate genes, and at the end, predict specific microRNA related to the mite TBI outcomes and our candidate genes. The result of this study indicate 11 genes are significantly related to the mite TBI. We applied Cytohaba plugin on these 11 genes to show protein-protein interaction between them based on the degree of interaction. 
As you can see in the image, 10 hop genes show a strong interaction and co-expression with each other. Darkest color represents high degree of interaction between our genes and the light color indicates lower degree of interaction. These genes are mainly involved in neuron projection regeneration, regulation of neuronal synaptic plasticity, memory, and cognitive function. Also in this study, we predict seven microRNA associated to my TBI outcomes and our candidate genes. These microRNA are mainly involved in nervous system signaling, neuron projection, and cell differentiation. At the end, we hope this study can help us to better understand the severity of my TBI and predict recovery timeline related to that. Also, we hope it can help us to treatment, to design treatment guidance following my TBI. Currently, we need MRI data and blood and urine sample to do uh, genomics and metabolomics analysis to confirm our genetic finding. And we will be run personalized MRI analysis to identify location and severity of injury with the help of TBI finder. Also, we will be repeat our sampling and MRI analysis in three months to evaluate recovery of our patient and assess whether genomics and metabolomics result can predict recovery timeline or not. Hello. Excellent work, Manas. This study wasn't possible without funding and Dr. Nosworthy's supervision. I want to say thank to him and they are my friends and my colleagues from his lab. Excellent work, Manas. Um, one question for you. Um, where did you get the, sam the TBI samples from for the RNA sequencing? Thank you so much um, for uh, inviting us to present in this excellent uh, conference. Um, actually, uh, this study was based on bioinformatics, and for next step, we will be have a patient um, uh, trauma, uh, my traumatic uh, brain with my traumatic brain injury, and uh, we hope we can get the fresh actually uh, patient with the one or two weeks after injury, and then we can confirm our results from the bioinformatics studies. Uh, it was just uh, bioinformatic and uh, literature reviews uh, research, which is shows these genes might be related to the my TBI. So we will be to confirm that in the next step. Thank you very Excellent much. work. Thank you very Thank much, you. Manas. Thank you so, so much. Let's continue with our Hello. next presenter. Hello everyone, this is Nada Musa, a research fellow at the Institute of Inflammation and Aging, University of Birmingham, assistant lecturer at Monophe University, Egypt. Today, we will talk about delirium post-emergency laparotomy, a longitudinal cross-sectional study. So what is delirium? Delirium is a neurobehavior syndrome. The patient presents to us with acute confusion, inattention, disorganized thinking, fluctuation in his mental state. Delirium is a medical emergency and it's related to underlying diseases, trauma, operations, and some medication. And it's associated with longer hospital stay and high mortality. In our study, we focused on post-operative delirium. We aimed in, this, in our work to investigate the incidence and risk factor of post-operative delirium and also outcome associated with it. We did that both prospectively and retrospectively. We recruited patients who are aging 65 years or more who underwent emergency laparotomy operation at Queen Elizabeth Hospital and those patients registered in National Emergency Laparotomy Audit Database. In the prospective part, we screened the delirium five days post-operatively using 4AT, MRAS, AMT10, CAM ICU. And finally, we diagnosed the delirium against the DSM-5 criteria. In the retrospective part, we scanned the clinical document for the keywords. We used a validated chart abstract method in the period of January 2018 to January 2019. And finally, we diagnosed the delirium against DSM-5 criteria. We found that out of 128 patients, 37 developed post-operative delirium, and this is quite significant as it's nearly one-third of the patients. We did univariate analysis. 
And we found that there is a significant relationship between post-operative delirium and aging, comorbidities like dementia or sepsis, pre-operative severity scores like peoplesome morbidity and mortality scores, NILA mortality scores, and ASA grades. We found also a relation, a significant relation between it and preoperative lab results like serum lactate and creatinine. We found some serious outcomes like mechanical ventilation, critical care admission, longer hospital stay, and higher mortality. We found age 70, sepsis, and people's morbidity score are independent risk factors. So in conclusion, post-operative delirium is a common complication after emergency laparotomy surgeries. We found multiple risk factors linked to it. Dementia, sepsis, people's morbidity are significant independent risk factor for post-operative delirium. Thank you very much. And any question, please. Thank you very much, Naida. Um, so one question, what, what is some of the, um, this, this is a high percentage, what are some of the, the solutions uh, doctors use for this uh, post-operative delirium? Um, uh, sorry, I couldn't hear the question. And uh, oh, could you see, yeah. please? Thank what, you. What, so, what, do, what, what are the, some of the so when a patient has this post-operative delirium, what what are some of the solutions the doctors offer? Oh, uh, actually, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not so sure. Are you asking about the treatment of post-operative delirium? Yeah, yeah. M uh, most of the patients treated like reorient the patient again. Uh, what is the time now? Uh, uh, what, do you know where are you now? Uh, do you know who is sitting next to you, his family, the date? Most of patients just give response to this, just reorient him. But some patients who is agitated, so we need to give him some medications like halopridols or something like that. Okay, yeah, thank you so much for having me in this conference. It's a pleasure. Thank you. There's another question from the public. So, uh, did the were the patients follow longitudinally to see if they develop Parkinsonism? Delirium has been reported as a possible risk factor for Lewy body dementia. Oh, this is really interesting question. Yeah, but uh, uh, in our study, we didn't follow the patient uh, after uh, the study so much. We just follow him for five days postoperatively and follow the mortality rate for thirty days. But we didn't follow uh, any cognitive, but it's really interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting. We could think about that. that yeah. Yeah, thank you for so much for this question. Thank you. Okay, great, great work. Thank you very much, Naida. So we'll uh, start with our next presenter. Hi, my name is Dana from the University of Queensland, and I'm going to talk today about using brain imaging and machine learning to explore potential biomarkers for dementia and Parkinson's disease. 80% of people living with Parkinson's disease will at some point develop dementia. However, we're not sure why some seem to decline in cognition faster than others. One theory is the dual syndrome hypothesis, which proposes that there are two cognitive syndromes in Parkinson's disease related to dysfunction of the frontal or posterior regions of the brain. The frontal syndrome presents with deficits in executive function and attention, whereas the posterior syndrome presents with deficits in memory and visuospatial function. And it's the posterior syndrome that's predicted to decline more rapidly than the frontal syndrome in terms of uh, cognitive ability. To identify these syndromes in our sample of 85 Parkinson's patients and compare their brain activity, we used a machine learning method called k-means clustering. We entered everyone's data from 10 frontal and posterior variables into the clustering algorithm, which then told us whether each patient was either frontally impaired, posterior impaired, not impaired at all, or globally impaired on almost everything. This allowed us to avoid using arbitrary cutoffs for cognitive measures to identify the subtypes and derive completely data-driven groups. Given that there was existing brain imaging data for a subset of these patients, we then explored differences between the posterior group, remember that's the at-risk group, group at risk of imminent dementia, and the cognitively intact group to see if we could identify any neuroimaging biomarkers for the at-risk group. Through analyzing the resting state functional magnetic resonance imaging data, which just looks at brain activity at rest, 
we found that the posterior cortical group demonstrated weaker connectivity between the right hippocampus and the right anterior temporal fusiform cortex at rest compared to the cognitively intact group. It's important to acknowledge the limited sample size of the data set and mention that we were unable to compare the posterior group to the frontal syndrome due to limited numbers in the frontal group. However, this finding is nonetheless interesting because if you look at the role of the fusiform cortex, it appears to be involved in not only episodic memory, but also semantic and visuospatial memory. And if we look distinctly at the measures that the posterior cortical syndrome were impaired in, we can see marked differences in each of these three memory processes. Like any interesting finding, the results leave more questions than they have answered. For example, what's the role of the fusiform gyrus and its connectivity to the hippocampus in the development of dementia and Parkinson's? Well, moving forward, we're planning to look further into this potential biomarker using larger longitudinal data sets with the hopes of developing a powerful and clinically useful tool for de identifying dementia risk in Parkinson's disease. Thanks for your time and please get in touch if you have any questions. Excellent job, Dana. Thank you very much. Uh, no questions from the public, so let's continue with our next presenter. Thank you very much to, to all the participants and Dr. Cuevas uh, for moderating this session. Uh, we're coming up to the last part of the program. This has been a very interesting year and well, year and a half, almost two years, a challenge for, for everyone. And we want to know in particular what has happened with doctoral students and professors that are uh, with us here today. Uh, to do so, we will use the Menti app to interact. So I will ask your friends from, from the support to start sharing the questions. Diana, can you help us? So you can point out your device to this QR code, or you can enter the website menti.com and type out these codes, three, six, six, nine, seven, nine, twenty, Two, six, the first question start is going to start in in the screen at any moment and is how do you feel during the COVID-19 pandemic? We are starting to see a few of the answers and I'm seeing uh, sad, alone, uh, anxious. I'm also seeing exhausted, uh, tired, panic, angry, frustrated. I can relate definitely to those uh, more than one. Um, we have already eight people participating. I will invite uh, all of you to, to go into the Menti app. Um, it's in menti.com and you can use the code 36697926. Uh, let down, a new one is upset, the other one unproductive, locked, alone, some colleague, that's a new word, I can, I will steal that one, confused, sad, frustrated, I'm seeing that the that word is growing in, in size, also frustrated and exhausted. Diana, can you move 
up for the next question, please. Uh, Mildred, it's the only question. Great. Thank you so much, Diana. Uh, to further discuss uh, these results, and first of all, I want to thank everyone for, for your participation and engaging. I will invite uh, Dr. Rosy Ortiz. She is the research professor and leader of the Cancer Research Group at Tecnológico de Monterrey. Welcome, Dr. Ortiz. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mildred, for the presentation. Now, I'm very, very pleased to introduce the participants um, of this interesting discussion forum. The new reality in the post-COVID stage, process that the doctoral students leaves. We saw many of the answers, and we already figured out how was this challenge for all of us and the students too. So I'm very glad to introduce Dr. Noreen Sheehan. Uh, Dr. Noreen is a lecturer in medical microbiology and her research group is located in the UCD Center for Experimental Pathogen Host Research. Noreen obtained her PhD entitled Investigation of the development of HIV-1 drug resistance in infections patients. From Warwick University, UK in 1996, and after graduation, she worked on a variety of infectious agents, including chlamydia, hepatitis C, and more recently in SARS-CoV-2. Dr. Noreen, research is molecular biology, and in particular, deciphering host pathogen interactions that contribute to the disease development in infectious individuals. Her group focus on interactions between virus and host immune response and cellular transcription machinery and signaling pathways. The overall aims of this study is to better understand viral immune <coughs> evasion and persistence in the host. Welcome, Dr. Noreen Chow. Our next panel, no, our other panelist is Dr. Juliet Rodriguez de Ita. Dr. Rodriguez de Ita is a medical doctor from the Autonomous University of Nuevo León in Monterrey, Mexico. She completed a master's degree in science with a specialty in immunology at the same university. She subsequently completed the specialty in pediatrics in the multicenter system of medical specialties in the Tecnológico de Monterrey and the Secretary of Health of the state of Nuevo León, obtaining the PhD in clinical science in this, in this institution. She's member of the National Research Council Level 1 and serves as director of the PhD in Clinical Science of Tecnológico de Monterrey. She is currently focused on clinical research applied, particularly in neurodevelopment and toxic stress in children. In children. She is the supervisor of postgraduate student in PhD in clinical science and the program of medical research. Welcome, Dr. Juliet. Our third panelist is um, a Master in Science, Laura Karen Urbina. Uh, Laura is a four-year PhD student in biomedical science at uh, Tecnológico de Monterrey, our institution here in Mexico. And for her doctoral research, she has been working in DNA genes, uh, DNA repair genes mechanisms and in young woman with breast cancer. 
Actually, she holds a master in science in biomedical biote biotechnology from Universidad Politecnica de Valencia, Spain, and a bachelor's in science in clinical biochemistry. Her, es her es expertise and interest uh, of Laura include cell culture, clinical analysis, and DNA repair mechanisms, cancer, and molecular biology. Her interest, her, her latest publication uh, titled Landscape of Germline Mutation in DNA Repair Genes for Breast Cancer in Latin America, <clears throat> give the opportunities for PARP like inhibitors and immunotherapy. So welcome our three panelists to these uh, interesting discussions. And we will conduct this discussion for um, asking some questions that we will see how how can uh, follow. So the first question is for all of you, all of three of you. <clears throat> After this pandemic, uh, this pandemic, COVID pandemic, we have been impacted in different ways in our life. So can you tell us? How did you manage to adapt to these circumstances? Maybe Dr. Noreen and then Julieta and then Laura can answer this. How did you manage for these circumstances? Hi, everyone. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, so um, I suppose we shut down here almost overnight in in march 2020 so really we had to convert very quickly to a different mode of teaching in addition we had to make provisions for um our research students to to actually uh more or less to leave the building and to start working uh remotely from uh so this really was an, a really steep learning curve, I think, for everybody. Learning the kind of new online teaching technologies, especially for somebody like me that's not very technically um, technology kind of orientated. But I think there was a lot of support from the university teaching and learning department um, that helped us to, to set up the, the system for recording and for doing online uh, online lectures. And I do think as well, the students were very understanding of the situation that we were in and that they were in, you know, that it was new to everybody and everybody was was learning really how to cope with it. Um, so yeah, I think that it was a very steep learning curve. And I think it come September last, <coughs> It was a lot easier in the sense that, you know, we were familiar with the situation and now we're faced this September with moving back because we're moving back now to face to face um, lectures, which just started today because our trimester, uh, our uh, year opens up right now. So that is new again, trying to cope with um, with that part of it. So, yeah, it has been challenging, to put it mildly. Thank you. And to Dr. Rodriguez. Yes. Um, I think since most, the, most of the researchers have suffered the impact of the pandemic in our plans. In the doctorate in clinical science of Tecnológico de Monterrey, 65% of the students were affected in different ways. Impediment to recruit patients due to the reconversion of COVID hospitals, lack of access to clinical files due to the lockdown, or lack of access to laboratories. On the other hand, there's a 90% decrease in international exchanges. However, students and professors have developed some extremely imaginative and creative responses to the pandemic that have demonstrated great resilience as well as the ability to adapt to enforcing. Under all these circumstances, some students have increased their publications of, on topics related to COVID-19 and have obtained funds for such research. Many professors have also focused in their efforts on research related to the pandemic. 
On the other hand, online attendance at international congresses and international discussion forums was strengthened and students were able to participate in it. So I think COVID-19 brought consequences to our plans, but we have shown resilience and we have to continue working on new ways to adapt to change and the new challenges of the post-COVID era. Great, great. Laura. Yes, as both uh, speakers have mentioned, I believe um, we were not expecting all these changes in such a short period of time. And as students, I believe uh, adapting to the changes, to the challenges has helped us to overcome uh, these difficult times. And also meditation sometimes could help to uh, focus to renew energies, to continue with our plans or our task for the day-to-day -day activities with these uh, new changes that the pandemic has brought for all of us. Thank you very much, very interesting answers. As we can see, uh, we were put in a challenges that we have to change. Uh, Dr. Singh uh, say about working remotely was a challenge. And for example, Julieta say about the, the new adaptations and the, the changes that have to do in research. And, and interesting, Laura, that you say that uh, meditation and adapting was the, the main challenge. So as we can see, we, we were in front of the changes and we adapt to that in different ways. Very, very interesting. And we are in, in different parts of the world and all we have this kind of feeling. Thank you very much. The, the, the second question is, is the, is the post-COVID campus environment no longer allows diversified interactions? How could institutions, departments, faculties, and staff creatively construct spaces that promote student development? Can we create these spaces with this restriction that we already have? Yes. Um, in the years of PhD studies, Dr. Rocio, some of the most valuable learning occurred outside the academic classroom in our daily interactions with faculty and peers, especially in intimate research team setting. But we are now in COVID-19 times, building relationships requires a formal process, an intentional action on multiple stages to successfully reach out to a peer or faculty member and find available time to meet. The virtual classroom and other activities will have to increase in complexity and diversity in roles and engagement to promote student growth to a level similar to an on-campus interaction. Regular and active efforts in reaching out to peers is very valuable. In Tecnológico de Monterrey, in our PhD programs, as, as, as an example, we make time for weekly online reunions between students and tutors to discuss life events, course plans, and research ideas, sharing joys and difficulties through laughter and mutual support. All this have to approach between teacher and students, strengthening the relationship between them. So I think it's very important to continually seek this interaction. And it's everyone's job to continue looking for the best way to strengthen human relationships and communications for the good of our students in the post-COVID era. Thank you, Julieta. And Dr. Noreen, how do you think? So, I think communication is, is really a, a key factor in this and really whether we do it on kind of a, a remote, using remote measures or not, it, it really does boil down to keeping the lines of communication open with the students and offering them kind of different tasks to do, as in, we'll say, for example, uh, presenting other people's uh, research material and, you know, having a discussion going that way, because that works quite, that works quite well with a small group. Uh, and, you know, that is, that is a good platform and not one really that we would have looked at um, before COVID, 
but it is one that we would hold on to post COVID um, as, as being more flexible than having to attend a, you know, an actual physical meeting, that type of thing. So I think COVID has given us kind of new ideas as to how we can do research and how we can help students to with their research and with their write-ups and with their preparations for various meetings and, and so on using different platforms. So I think there, there has been some quite a, a few advantages and uh, that has come out of, of COVID that we'll, we will be maintaining as, as we go Thank forward. Yes, in, we have in, com in common that we think we have to favor the communication with the different tasks and discussions yes. and flexibility. Yeah. This word having frequent <laughs> flexibility because now we have different situations the students have in different places, not in the same room, not looking for the same uh, situation in the environment. So they maybe they have someone seeking at home or different situation that we have to challenge and we we have to be clear in these um, different environments that our students and faculty have. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, for, for Laura, I, I have this question for Laura, mainly but all of you can answer, of course. Uh, Laura, did your plans change due to the COVID-19? For example, your program exchange, your material, your, your work in the laboratory, how, how many changes do you, you, you uh, have for, for in the, in during this time? Well, yes, I believe I'm not the only one as a doctoral student who suffer from these changes, but um, mainly from for, for the lock when the lock the lockdown was taking place, uh, we had to redesign our study experiments. The timelines were also an issue, but I think being creative and thinking about other options to complete the task and, um, and the study program that we are following is, is a good strategy. And we're still working on it and finding new solutions to complete uh, the doctoral program. But the program has to be complete. That's yeah. another point. <laughs> we, we cannot stop it. And Dr. Rodriguez and Dr. Norin, um, do you have some strategies that have worked in laboratories or classroom uh, to get ahead in, in these circumstances? Some specific changes that you, you made for this? Well, I think strategies to maintain the integrity of going studies, including patient follow-up, safety assessment, and continuation of investigational products have included a shift to telemedicine, remote safety laboratory monitoring, and shipping investigational products to a study subject. Unique issues that face the research community include maintenance of infrastructure, funding, completion of studies in the predetermined time frame, and the need to reprogram care path timeline, career path timelines. Real-world databases, biomarker and long-term follow-up studies and research involved special groups like me with children <laughs> are likely to face unique challenges. But I think the implementation of telemedicine has been dramatically accelerated and will serve as, and will serve as a backbone for the future of clinical research. So I think as we move forward, innovation in clinical trial design will be essential for conducting, optimi for conducting optimized clinical research in the post-COVID era. Dr. Norin. Well, I, I think one of, one of the main problems that we are encountering here now is actually obtaining reagents. There's, there really does seem to be a, um, a real slowdown in us being able to get, because I work in, a, or my lab is kind of wet lab, actually getting the reagents in. And I think that is really impeding the progress of some of the PhD students in their, um, 
in their work. Now, that was not something that we had expected to be such a, a problem, but it, it certainly seems um, it certainly seems to be. So, like from a wet lab point of view, I guess the 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 pandemic meant that the students were no longer able to do their experiments in in the lab for at least maybe four or five months but those students were then offered extensions of the amount of time maybe five about five months onto the end of their phd so that they can catch up on the wet lab work that um they missed out on so that that is um that's going to be very helpful to them going forward. Mm, interesting, very interesting, because we face the same problem for all kinds of reagents, for COVID diagnostic reagent, for example, yeah. oh, was a very difficult for, but in general, all the importation and exportations uh, changed a lot. They were very slow now, very difficult, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a key and interesting point. And about the, the telemedicine, Dr. Rodriguez, is, is good, but what about students for, for um, surgery or for some other practice that they need practice? They really need to, to work with hands. It's, it's a difficult point too. So we are improving many things in many areas, but of course, we, we need to, to be in contact and be uh, present in some of the others. So this is a really, a really challenge for, for continuing or this direction and education. And, and for example, in this same way, if the COVID pandemic persists, do you think it will be convenient to continue with these online classes? Or should we get used to this situation and start over again, like normal life? We have to adapt and continue, and no matter what happened, because uh, that's the new life, or we should uh, still waiting for a little more time to go back. Dr. Noreen. Oh, oh Dr. Julieta. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. That's an interesting question, Rocio. <laughs> uh, but I believe that circumstances are different in each country. Since each government has handled the pandemic in different ways, the vaccination strategy and the percentage of vaccinated people is different. And therefore, the mitigation of cases is different. But I definitely believe that vaccination is a strategy that will undoubtedly allow us to reopen our laboratories, our, campus, little, our campuses, little by little, and with the proper security protocols. Access to the vaccine, I think, will be the resource that will allow us to return to a new normality, I hope. Yeah, like, I mean, um, I, I feel that maybe we can have a blended approach to, or, you know, that we should use a blended approach based on, our feedback from the students during the pandemic. A lot of them really liked the online learning and they liked the recordings, but of course there is that drawback in the social interaction part and, and all of that support they get, peer support that they get from one another. But, uh, you know, I, I think we could perhaps do both and kind of blend online with in-person um kind of learning as as it goes forward and i think certainly for us that seems to be what we're going to actually do even though we are recommended now face-to-face -face lectures um but at the same time we are recording them for any students that ha have to stay out for medical reasons they, they might be positive or something uh, like that so maybe a blended approach i think there's merit in both Thank you. Thank you. And we finally someday we have to go back, but I think we have to go, go back with something that has changed. Now we realize that we have to be more flexible and even in the normal face-to-face -face, um, activities, 
maybe we will combine the online the online uh, um, sessions with the uh, live session. Maybe we already changed. No, we are not going to back like before. No, no one, no more uh, the same that we were. We, we changed a lot. And now we are combining a lot of technologies that also were, was a challenge for all of us. But yeah, we, we have a new real life. Thank you. And hold on one second. The, the, the next question is for all of you. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed us in every way, but uh, maybe some benefits and adversities have you found by conducting online classes. And, but do you think that the, this has delayed the learning? Is um, not enough all the information that we give online? I would like to, to, to hear the answer from all of you, also Laura as students. Well, I, I think during the pandemic, educational innovations, as you say, have occurred to make the universal adoption of remote learning a possibility. But one key challenge is access. Here, extensive problems remain, including the lack of internet connectivity in some locations. However, creative solutions have emerged to provide students with the facility and resources needed to engage in a successfully for complete course coursework. The year 2020 has also increased availability and adoption of electronic resources and activities that are now integrated into online learning experiences, like synchronous, synchronous online conferencing systems, such as Zoom and Google Meet, have allowed experts from anywhere in the world to join online classroom, and have allowed presentations to be recorded for individual learners to watch out a time most convenient for them. Furthermore, the importance of, of hands-on hands experiential learning had led to innovations such as virtual trips and virtual labs, Therefore, I believe that online education has completely changed the way of educating, educating and will be adopted in future without a doubt. I think that. What do you think is the light? The quality is the same? Dr. Nuri? Um, to be frank, um, I really don't think it's the same. I think there is nothing like face-to-face -face, um, teaching and learning for students that you can you can really get a discussion going in a, in a classroom situation that you will never get going online, even though you might encourage them to do that. It 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 just is not the same, and there you probably won't get the the same participation either with the online thing because people get really jaded and tired of looking at a screen all day long it's been really tough i think on students um, and really a lot of isolation and being cut off from their their um their friends is is very difficult but then along with that the online teaching it, it kind of, it offers a lot of opportunities as well. Um, you know, people uh, can attend lectures if they're not, if they're not feeling well enough to come in or if they're, you know, various family situations that they might find themselves. So, you, you know, it does give those type of opportunities to, to students as well, which um, they wouldn't ordinarily have. Um, but I suppose the level of engagement with online teaching can be poor at times um, because of that tiredness that sets in and you know just that lack of physical visual interaction that you don't get with online. Thank you Dr. Noreen. Laura? 
What is your feeling about this? I believe that some benefits from this uh, new modality for, for classes is that it's it can be time saving for, for some of us because we don't have to commute or go to the university and we can save some time there. But also one um, um, adversity could be that we miss this social interaction with our professors, with our classmates, and that can really make a very, um, very confusing sometimes to take the online classes. And also if there are questions in the sessions in a um, physical class, we just raise our hands and say, oh, I have this question. But in, in this uh, modality, we can send an email and wait for a response and then, oh, I forgot to ask this, another email. So it can be a bit more tiring in this modality. Yes, a lot of information by computer. So the final, the final question is like um, an opinion about the, do you think the, the research the scientific research is affected, will be affected. You know, the knowledge that we give to the student now in global, the research is gonna be affected. Do you mean their outputs? Yes, the outputs um, or the light mm -hmm. too. Many experiments were holding for, for reagents or for time to go back. Or, how can be affected? Yeah, I I do think it will be affected if they're not if the the students are not afforded extra time to catch up and to make up for the time that you know that they have um, that they have lost. But having said that, it's given some students the opportunity, we'll say, to work on topics that they wouldn't normally have worked on. Like for example, here, um, the normal projects, you know, on, on other viruses, that was kind of put on hold, but then the students were allowed to work on COVID related projects. So they, they got kind of different experience, even though that cannot go forward for their PhDs, but they did gain experience the, they probably were not expecting and that they may very well be able to apply that to their own projects when you know when everything gets back up and running so um you know i think it's it's been a fantastic you know all the research that has been done on COVID so quickly um has been really great for research students to look at and to kind of try to gain an understanding because everybody was more or less starting from the same place. Like, I mean, this was really unknown and you you could get the students to follow it through, you know, in, in, in a way that they would never really normally get the opportunity to do from the very start um, up. So I think it, it's given certain, it's probably expanded their knowledge a lot better, a, a lot more than they would have had if they just continued on working on the project that they had been on. But then of course they have to go back to the project and they have to finish that project and get their, their degrees, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Dr. Julieta. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. I think in, in particular in clinical research, we need to rethink, rethink our research study, uh, including shift to another, another project, or um, um, another, in this time, focus on coronavirus disease research, maybe. So I think uh, it's very hard to us, but we need to, to, to start for looking for new ways to, to rethink our research strategy. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for this opinion. Maybe in the area of micro, microbiology, infectology, there's plenty of information that we could, couldn't imagine how, a lot of, how much information we are learning and having now. But yes, maybe rethinking in other areas or in other projects or, 
how, how conduct the other projects and, and go back, as you say, Dr. Norin, and take our activities and rethinking, rethinking in this, uh, all activities that we will do. Thank you very much. They were very interesting these opinions from different countries and maybe some experience are in common and we are challenging so many changes and we are able to, to pursue it for this. So finally, uh, I want to thank Dr. Rodriguez, Dr. Norin, and finally, uh, the doctoral student Laura Urbina will share with us her experience as a doctoral student during this post-COVID stage. So it's like a reflection uh, uh, about this. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. Um, I believe that we all have struggled with, within this period of time, especially as doctoral students, we have made, faced many challenges and we are also thinking about new ways to overcome these, these things to continue and complete our study courses. So I think one challenge that we may have faced is that we need to be physically present in our laboratories and hospitals in contrary to other disciplines that it can be a bit different. So this has been a challenge for us to continue with our experiments mainly. Also, I think that the way of interaction uh, has been a challenge because many of us were used to um, a face-to-face -face interaction and uh, going to the virtual platforms has not been accepted uh, equally to all students. Some may have struggled a bit more than others. And also, I believe it's important to continue with communication and information with our supervisors, with our thesis directors, with our classmates, to have a, a good um, understanding of this new reality. Also, I believe, as we all have mentioned, that flexibility is key. Maybe it's not as easy as it sounds because it, it, it implies many changes that we have to make, many ways we have to adapt and cope with all these new things that we are experiencing. But it also makes us to be more creative, to come up with new solutions or um, alternatives to complete with our programs and our experiments as well. And also, I believe it's important to recognize our institutions, such as uh, Tecnológico de Monterrey that has provided as with the tools, the spaces, the guidelines and health protocols so we can continue with our studies even though we're living in these difficult times. And well, as a conclusion, I would say that it is important for us as doctoral students to manage our expectations. It may not, it may not be the same as before these new times. And also we should celebrate our small achievements not only the big ones, so it can give us more uh, a positive outlook for everyday activities. And something that is really important also is that we take care of our mental health because without it, it can be really hard to continue with our study programs. And um, also I believe it's important to ask for help. Mm, maybe we're not really used to do that or to be open to new um, areas of work such as Dr. Noreen mentioned, but uh, everyone is willing to help us if we ask for, for them, for help. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Laura. It's, this round was very interesting. And in the, in the, Menti, in the Menti activity that uh, Mildred put in the, in the session, nobody said, I was positive or happy or I enjoy. So we should learn to enjoy our new life and thinking that we have to be happy in this matter of, of way. And that's it, this is what we have, as people say, this is what we have. So we should enjoy too and, and be more positive for this, this situation. Maybe this is the, the situation that we will see for 
more more months or more at least one year. So I decide for all, all of you happiness and healthy. And thank you very much for letting me conduce this uh, round. Very, very creative, very nice. Thank you, Tecnológico Monterrey. Thank you very much, Dr. Ortiz, and to all of our panelists. You did a wonderful uh, job. Um, I want to invite everyone to go into the platform again and visit the posters. You can interact with them and, and send out comments to the authors. A strength of this virtual forum is that the forum doesn't finish when we close the Zoom call. The, this platform is yours, and I will invite you to make the most out of it. Uh, we are arriving to a highly awaited part of the program as we are about to announce the doctoral student presentation that received the, that will receive the award as best presentations. Uh, I know it was a hard process and that the advisory committee had a, a very hard time selecting one of the projects because uh, the, the quality was amazing. So without further ado, we would like to congratulate Kajiso Prince Tukisi with the project uh, development of a scope of practice for advanced midwife and neonatal nursing specialists in South Africa. Congratulations to everyone. Well, um, I have to say that I have kind of mixed feelings now as I'm really excited about the discussions that we have shared today and about what comes next as we, we aim to build and continue expanding research. But I'm really sad because this is about to finish. So thank you very much for joining us today. It has been a little close to four hours of pure learning, sharing, and joy. I hope to be able to meet you all uh, in person in the next doctoral student forum. But please enjoy the rest of the U21 meeting. And please stay in touch. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.